minutes away from the command to fire the engines for the 24th running of the Daytona 500. And right now, Ned Jarrett is about to introduce you to the starting rows for this race. Ned? Ken, I've never seen a more perfect day for a Daytona 500 than we have here today. Starting on the pole is Benny Parsons with a brand new qualifying record, a speed of 196.317 miles per hour. He's driving the Harry Rainier entry number 28. Benny, you ready for him? I think so, Ned. It, car feels pretty good. Everything looks good. Well, that's what it takes. Starting on the outside is Harry Gant in the Hal Needham Burt Reynolds car number 33, and he'll be carrying one of the CBS cameras here today. Starting in third place is a former winner of the Daytona 500, Cale Yarbrough in car number 27. Cale, can you do it again? No, we sure hope so, Ned. Uh, nothing will suit us better than to win this 500 today. And starting on the outside of the second row in fourth place is Buddy Baker, who won here two years ago in Hoff Ellington's car number one. He won one of the qualifiers here on Thursday, starting in the third row. Terry Labonte in Billy Hagen's car number 44. Terry, you look a little nervous. I wasn't supposed to look nervous. <laughs> well, I guess you can't do what you want to do all the time. Darrell Waltrip, the Grand National Champion of NASCAR, is starting on the outside of the third row in sixth position in car number 11. Starting fourth row inside, the former winner at Daytona here, Bobby Allison, has looked awfully strong in the qualifying races in Bill Gardner's car number 88. Bobby, how do you feel about today? Well, Ned, I feel good. I hope we have a good race, and I hope uh, everybody can stay out there and race. Starting on the outside of the fourth row is Joe Rutman in J.D. Stacy's car number two. He'll be carrying the other CBS camera here today, and you'll see some fantastic shots from those cars. Starting in the fifth row inside, you've already heard from him, A.J. Floyd of Houston, Texas. A.J., is that new engine going to do okay for you? Well, I hope so. Junior Johnson won a lot of uh, races, and he was nice enough to sell us this engine. Starting on the outside of this fifth row, the 1980 Grand National Champion. It's been a while since he's been in victory lane. Is Bud Moore's car number 15 with Dale Earnhardt at the keyboard. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's meet the rest of the starting field for the 24th Daytona 500. Moving to row number six, Dave Marcus of Wausau, Wisconsin, and Kyle Petty, 21 years old, youngest driver in the race. Row seven, Rick Wilson and Neil Bonnet with the Wood Brothers, number 21. Going to row number eight, it'll be Richard Brooks of Portoville, California, and Ricky Rudd with a new team from Chesapeake, Virginia. In row nine, it's Jimmy Sauter of Nidica, Wisconsin, and Elliot Forbes Robinson of La Crescenta, California. Starting to row 10, Rusty Wallace, Ustak's stock car champion, and Bill Elliott from Georgia. Going to row 11, the King, seven-time winner, Richard Petty, and the big surprise, Ron Bouchard from Pittsburgh, Mass. In row 12, it's Jody Ridley and Morgan Shepard. Row 13, Tom Sneva, Indianapolis fame, and the sensation of the Midwest, Mark Martin. Going to row 14, Joe Milliken out of High Point, North Carolina, and from Villa Park, Illinois, Bobby Wowak. In row 15, Donnie Allison on the comeback trail and Ty Scott of Financial, Pennsylvania. In row 16, Gary Ballou, the hot foot from Fort Lauderdale, Florida and Lake Speed of Jackson, Mississippi. In row 17, J.D. McDuffie and Jeff Bodine. Row 18 is Billy Harvey, a hot foot, a fast driver, and Lowell Cowell. They'll come up fast. Row 19, Delmer Court, and from Victoria, British Columbia, Vancouver, Roy Smith. Moving to row 20, Buddy Arrington, Martinsville, Virginia, and Huntsville, Alabama's Jimmy Means, and out back, Stan Barrett of Bishop, California, and Tommy Gale from North Huntington, Pennsylvania. The 42 starters for the 24th Daytona 500. Field out of turn number four. We'll review the starting grid for you again in just a moment. You see one of the safety cars dropping onto the inside and coming down onto pit road. It's Benny Parsons and Harry Gant for row one. Kaylee Arborough, twice a winner here, and Buddy Baker, who won it back in 1980 at the fastest clip ever in the history of this race, in row two. Row three is Terry Labonte and Darrell Waltrip. Row four, Bobby Allison and Joe Rutman. Strong candidate, that Rutman. Row five, Air Supertex, A.J. Foyt, looking for his first stock car win since 1972 when he won this as well as Ontario, California. Dale Earnhardt's in that row with him, and then in row six, it's Dave Marcus and Kyle Petty, who never looked better than the 125-mile qualifying races this past Thursday. Row seven, Rick Wilson and Neil Bonnet. What a tenacious driver he is. Row eight, Richard Brooks and Ricky Rudd. Going to row nine, you have Jimmy Sauter and Elliot Forbes Robinson, the former Can-Am and Trans-Am champion. Then comes Rusty Wallace and Bill Elliott in row ten. 
the 11th row, Richard Petty, about where he usually qualifies, and Ron Bouchard, who won that stunning race at Talladega on CBS last August. Row 12 is Jody Ridley and Good Shepherd. Moving to row 13, the great Indianapolis veteran, all the way from 33rd to 2nd there two years ago, Tom Sneva and Mark Martin, three times, he's only 23 years old, ASA champion out of the Midwest. Row 14, Joe Milliken and Bobby Wolak. Then going to row 15, Donnie Allison and Ty Scott. Row 16, Gary Ballou and Lake Speed. In row 17, J.D. McDuffie, Jeff Bodai. Row 18, Billy Harvey and Lowell Cowell. Going to row 19, Del McCord and Rose Smith. Row 20, it's Buddy Arrington and Jimmy Means. And then in row number 21, Stan Barrett and Tommy Gale stand back. They're about to turn them loose here at Daytona. Benny Parsons nestled on the pole. The fourth straight year that the Harry Rainier 28 car carried his colors to the front position for this race. More significantly, I suppose, of course, the fact that Waddell Wilson's been the crew chief on that car through all this time and is one of the best engine men in North American NASCAR racing. Down they come out of turn number four. Harry Gant, the bandit, up on the outside. Benny Parsons, 1975, Daytona 500-mile champion. As a standing ovation greets them at the starting line, as per usual, down to the flag. The green is out. underway. From Harry Gant's car, you see his brake as he goes down. Buddy Baker right behind him. Terry Labonte on the inside. Gant going high as he tries to squeeze through for the lead, but no, not to go his way. Benny Parsons goes out in front of number 28. The most dangerous part of the race, these first 15 or 20 laps, as they get up over 195 miles an hour, Kelly Yarborough goes to the lead. Gant goes into second place. Richard Petty is moving up through traffic quickly. On the outside of him is Ricky Rudd in number three. Back out of turn number four, coming about to complete the first of 200 laps. At the strike, Cale Yarborough first. Gant is in second. Labonte is in third. Parsons drops to fourth. Buddy Baker is in fifth. Well, there's 500 miles to go, but you never know. Look at that go around here. Just absolutely side by side in the most massive draft. Joe Rutman riding right behind number 11. That is Darrell Waltrip. Rutman right there at full speed. Remember, he finished second at Riverside, California. The last race of last year, many say he is the super dark horse of this race. Joe Rutman, whose elder brother won in Indianapolis back in the early 50s. Harry Gant screaming down the back straightaway in car number 33, right there with Labonte. Harry Gant's in the lead. <laughs> putting that in-car camera facing front. He said all he wanted to see from his pictures today was nothing but clear track in front of him. And right now it is clear sailing for car number 33. And there's the picture out of the back window of Harry Gant's car. Right there is Terry Labonte, the young man who won Darlington two years ago and gets stronger. And look at him pull up in draft inches away at near 200 miles an hour. Incredible pictures. Absolutely fantastic. And you get an idea from the way that fence is slingshotting by there. These guys are doing about 400 feet a second or close to at that stage. Then that the rough football bank. field a second. Bandit still out in front. Darrell Walship going low there as they came around turn four. Making a bit of a charge at the front. Going across the stripe side by side with Cale Yarbrough. Joe Rutman going to the tri-oval to the 18-degree banking. Now watch him as he goes into turn number one. We're back with the leaders again. He really has to fight that car in turn number one at that tremendous speed. Right in front of him is Dale Earnhardt. You can see his hands struggling with that wheel. Tremendous G-forces at this stage trying to throw that car high up against that outside retaining wall. The two leaders really, really nose to tail. Terry Labonte, car number 44, right there with Harry Gant in that green and white car number 33. Bobby Allison there's dropping Richard on the Petty, uh, being closely following our second camera. And there's uh, something broken away from the car there, going through turn four. It looked like the rear spoiler. Let's see who it came off from. It was right there's a car in the wall. A big shot coming out of turn number Young four. Nillican has crashed, and his car is slithering and sliding down into turn number four. But I really think that piece of a car came off one of the front runners, and uh, that must have caused the mayhem further back in the field. And that's Joe Mellick's number 50. 
Joe Millican was one of the guys that I had down as an outside shot of winning this race. There's what came off. Looks like a bumper came away. It certainly does. An entire bumper pulled off. There's number 66, Lake Speed from Mississippi. His car battered in the back end. The average speed, until the caution, was 192 miles per hour. They're coming back to the line. They're coming very slowly. Up through turn number four. Number 23, Jeff Bodine has come in. And here are pictures from Joe Rutman's car as he comes around through where the Holocaust took place in turn number four. There was a piece of debris lying in the track there, whatever it was in the first place. Um, it's kind of early for these guys to stop for a pit stop to put any gas in. At this stage, it will hardly be worthwhile. But that really has broken up this field. There's some, some quite good potential cars got wiped out in that horrendous... Earnhardt has moved into third. Buddy Baker now in the fourth position. And we're going to have a chance to look and replay as Joe Milligan clambers out of car number 50, the Cliff Stewart car, number 50, Joe Milliken, out of his car, and let's look in replay and see if we can spot what happened here. There we see the thing flying through the air. See, it definitely came off that first bunch of 10 cars, and I guess it lands on somebody. Yes, it hits Joe Milliken right in the windshield there. Is that Milliken that finally loses? Yes, it was. It was Milliken. It landed right on his windshield. Well, no wonder he lost control. And as you can see, he sets up the most tremendous dust and smoke screen, which makes visibility for the people behind him almost impossible. And then before you know where you are, there's cars just going everywhere. It's the, it's the bumper off car number 88, they say, the Allison car. Here's Ned Jarrett. Gary Nelson is the crew chief on it. Gary, what was the problem? Well, Bobby told me somebody bumped him from the rear, turned him sideways, and apparently knocked the bumper off. Are you bringing him in? We're not, we're having a, Bobby pulled up alongside of another car to have him look at the quarter panel to see if the tire was rubbing. If the tire's not rubbing, we're going to stay out. Okay, so it must have been a pretty clean cut uh, bumper coming off of there, Ken. That's unusual to lose a bumper in a Daytona 500, but you never know what's going to happen next. Uh, it seems pretty unusual for a bumper to fly uh, where these guys touch all the time, and I would have thought it would have taken. Let's we see if we can see if it touch. They say we have another replay, and we may actually see Allison getting touched. Who says these guys don't get together out there? There's Kale right behind the 88, and there's the bumper disengaging itself. Now, remember, they're covering 300 feet a second, so the shot could have come to the back of car 88 before our shot began. Car number 27, Yarbo right there. Now they're picking up Lake Speeds, car number 66. Certainly looks as if the bumper came off on its own. Here is Ned Jarrett with Joe Milliken. Joe Milliken was driving. The car number 50 was involved in that altercation. Joe, what happened there? Well, Ned, I don't know. I seen something, you know, something fell off somebody's car and was sliding across the racetrack. And I run across it and blow the right front tire out, and then I hit the wall. It was a bumper off of Bobby Allison's car. I didn't know what it was. I seen it sliding on the racetrack, and just as I run across it, blow my right front tire out, and I just hit the wall. Then. You seem to be okay, though. Yeah, it's tore the car up, and I'm like, Well, that's too bad. He was running awfully good. Had his high... Had high hopes here today of a good finish. Joe Milliken, who has raced here three previous times in his fourth Daytona 500, 31 years old, a protege of Richard Petty, had actually won a Sportsman 300. That's the prelude race that they operate each Saturday before the Sunday 500. And he has uh, had some consistent finishes over the years. Over half of the 67 races that he's run, he finished in the top 10. We're under caution with six laps complete. And Harry Gant leads the Daytona 500. Next Saturday on CBS Sports, great college action as Notre Dame meets South Carolina. Be a part of the excitement here at the home of the NCAA championship, CBS Sports. After a horrific crash, we are still in our caution period, the first one of the day coming in lap number three. Ned Jarrett is standing by with one of the victims of that accident. And it's Lake Speed, who is driving the car number 66. Lake, how did you see it happen? Well, I was just kind of watching the traffic in front of me, really trying to wait until everything sorted out before I tried to make any moves. And coming off the fourth corner, I looked up in front of me and I saw a car turn right like you said now into the end of the wall. I knew there was going to be a lot of traffic. And so I started checking it up and waving to the people behind me to slow down. But uh, I had to get in that smoke. Did you see all that smoke? I entered it and didn't know what was going on. About that time, I got clipped from the back end, and it spun me, you know, turned me, and, and got me going across the track into the wall. You see right there where I got clipped in the back end, and it turned me. You were sort of at the mercy of whatever was going to happen right there. Yep. When that smoke, I went into that smoke, and I knew, well, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. About that time, I felt I got a lick from the back, 
Mike, how were the track conditions before this happened? Everything was fine. The car felt fine to me. You know, I think everybody was more or less just sort of waiting until it kind of lined out, and then they started making the moves. Well, we're sorry you had this problem here this early in the race, but glad you're okay. Well, thank you. I'm just sorry for my sponsors at King's Inn and uh, all the other people, Roger Hamby and the crew, that did such a good job of preparing the car before I got down here. And, you know, we made a really good run in qualifying, and we'd really hope to do a lot better. Well, Ken, this fellow could qualify for a commentator the way he described that accident there. Indeed he could. 34-year-old Lake Speed, the 1978 World Karting Champion, running his first Daytona 500 a year ago. He uh, won the consolation race but failed to make the 500. Number 23 is being pulled back behind the wall. That'll become the third car to retire after that incident. And the left rear quarter panel on the Bob and Richard Bear car from Oxford, Maine, being driven by Jeff Bodine, becomes the third car out of the race. And you can see they're still picking up debris up in the banking of turn number four, David. And there you see that guy. It gives you some idea of just how steep that banking is when you see that man uh, standing on it. Minus a bumper. Traffic violation there for car number 88. Absolutely. I feel particularly sorry, I must add, for Lake Speed. I came down here on the same airplane as him, kept bumping to him in all sorts of odd, dark bars. And I'm sorry to see him uh, out of the race and out of Daytona so soon. Three cars have gone back to the garage area, and now I believe we're going to see a fourth come out. They're reporting that Billy Harvey also will retire with an engine problem. And we also have a report there are two cars with cracked windshields. One is number 02, Mark Martin, originally came out of Arkansas, now out of New Albany, Indiana. And number 17 car is also Lowell Cowell's machine showing a cracked windshield. There's the bumper missing on the back of car number 88, Bobby Allison. When you see these cars perched up on the 31 degree banking, it's fun to look at from here, but from inside those race cars, it's a totally different perspective. We asked Tom Sneva about the visibility from a race car on the banking of the Daytona Speedway. Well, you don't see much once you get into the banking, so it's very important to take a look before you get to the corner. Look across the racetrack and see if there's any trouble developing, because once you get in the, once you get onto the banking, uh, the vision is very limited. Less than what, 300 feet, David? I would say about that, yeah. It, um, it depends how low your windshield, uh, the roof line comes, of course, the uh, blanking you have across the shield, but it is very difficult, and as he says, you've got to have a jolly good look before you get there. Uh, to make sure that it's clear before you arrive. There is the picture from Joe Rutman's car, car number two, Rutman out of Upland, California, with a car that has been strong all through the week through uh, time trials and the 125-mile qualifying races on Thursday. And as we come toward 10 laps, let's review how the cars are running out here at the present time. Terry Gantz, number 33, is up on the point. Terry Labonte is in second. Bobby Allison maintains third. A little tentative out there now. Without that rear bumper, it should have an effect on the aerodynamics well, of this car. Him at all. The fourth place car overall is Dale Earnhardt. Running fifth on the field is Buddy Baker. The sixth place car is Cale Yarborough. Seventh is Waldrop. The eighth place car was the man who sat on the pole, Benny Parsons. Then in ninth is Joe Rutman, from whom you just saw those pictures. Then in the 10th position is Kyle Petty in number 42. The 11th position is Neil Bonnet, while resting 12th is Dave Marcus. 13th overall is Ricky Rudd, and 14th is A.J. Foyt. Once again, here's Ned Jarrett. Billy Harvey just pulled into the garage area in car number 31. They're working on the car there, Billy. First one went wrong. Well, beginning of the race when we started, uh, the motor starts started missing a little bit, and then it tried to act like it wanted to clear up, and we kept going, and then just before that caution came out, it just down the back straightaway, it just the motor just died on it. Well, he's working on it. Will he be able to fix it? Well, we're trying to see if it dropped the valve or not. If you know, we're not sure. Okay. We're not at this time. We're not sure what it is, and we're hoping we can fix it to get back out. Well, of course, he's losing a lot of valuable time. Now let's go to pit road and Larry Newber. Well, Ned, I'm in Kel Yarbrough's pit. This is Tim Brewer, the crew chief, and. Tim, you got some more information on the beginning of that incident, do you not? Well, uh, Kale said uh, that Bob and he touched, but uh, I got a feeling that uh, somewhere along the lines, that bumper was intended to come off, and I don't know 
you know, in what manner it was, you know, fastened on the car, but it wasn't fastened on there good enough to uh, stay. As near as you can tell, is your car still in perfect working condition? Well, you know, it didn't hurt the car, and it might have damaged some of the front sheet metal, but the car's pretty much still intact. It's, you know, didn't damage our car, but uh, the bumper went right over the top of Buddy Baker's car, and uh, that's, that's won an awful lot to want to win that way. Well, Ken, an early incident for a couple of the top runners, but it looks like Kale is okay. Well, there you heard it from uh, Tim Brewer claiming that bumper was set to come off, perhaps to help the aerodynamics. Is that what he's saying, David? Well, that's, well I think he's saying it's set to come off to upset the field. Uh, I, I can't imagine how it would help the aerodynamics. It can only hinder the aerodynamics. Um, and if what he says is, if he really thinks what he says, I mean, that's a pretty serious accusation to make against another team. I find that hard to believe. Here they are coming down. Look at the monitor again. It's car number 50, Milliken, in the Cliff Stewart car wraps the outside retainer solidly and behind him in that evasive action. Now, Richard Petty has fought him back to 19th. He really got on the binders. He wasn't going to take any chances. And as usual, that. Richard Petty just managed to get away with it here at Daytona. His, uh, I guess, his all-time favorite track. The cars have got one lap to go on this caution and before they come up to the green flag again to continue the running of this Daytona 500. 11 laps have now been completed. Only 180 go. 27 and a half miles down to the Daytona 500. $925,000 at stake and there you see the story which isn't very much at the present time after a exciting start two laps of really good racing. Caution coming on here and Harry Gant continues to stay out in front of a couple of cars on pit road. That is Morgan Shepard in car number 98. Won his first Grand National race last year at Martinsville, Virginia. Buddy Perrin, you saw the crew chief pounding on the side of the car to indicate to Morgan to get out there and get with it. Here he is coming back on the track. Morgan Shepard ran for Rookie of the Year last year and placed second to Ron Bouchard, who's out here this afternoon in car number 47, making his first Daytona 500 appearance. Ron Bouchard, of course, won the Talladega 500 last year, seen on CBS television, and has been running very well this week. Uh, made a very good dash in the clash last week, and uh, I've got high hopes for young Ron Bouchard. <laughs> All right, we're ready for resumption as they come around to complete lap number 12. It's number 33, the bandit, Harry Gant, in the green and white livery coming down to the stripe as we are ready to resume the great American race. And there's the picture from Harry Gant's car as they scoot down through the trioval and go for turn number one. Down to the inside drops Bobby Allison. Allison pulls up alongside. He's going to go wheel to wheel with Gant. There he is. Look at this picture as he goes right up and you're watching Bobby Allison from inside Harry Gant's car take first place. Terry Labonte dropping back to third, holding on in there. Dale Earnhardt is fourth. Now, this would be a good opportunity to have a look at that bumper damage from close up, but uh, old Harry Gant's not turning that too long, and he's right alongside him again as they go into turn three at the end of that fast back straight going close to 200 miles an hour here, and there's Dale Earnhardt coming up on the inside. To second place, Allison on the outside in third. Buddy Baker back there just a bit. Labonte is in fourth, then Baker is in fifth. Back they come. Earnhardt slipped into second spot. Labonte is alongside him as they go over the line. Darrell Waltrip runs in seven. Back at turn number one. Eighth place car, Benny Parsons. Ninth place car, Joe Rutman. Richard Petty beginning to make some maneuvers out of that 19th position. Here they are in the back straightaway. And another pass for the lead is going to put Dale Earnhardt, who had a dismal 1981. Champion made over five hundred thousand dollars, and then he went cold in nineteen eighty one. Didn't score a victory. Hoping to change all that this afternoon. Back in, back in turn three, I think Kyle Petty is going to come into the pits. His father just passed on the back straight, and Kyle Petty is slowing down and coming into the pits. This is going to be a big disappointment for that young man. And Dale Earnhardt takes the lead here. Dale Earnhardt out in front. Kyle Petty, who drove a magnificent 125-mile qualifying race in the pits. Here's Ned. They're changing the left side tires. Apparently, they had one going down. A tough break here for a young fellow that had his hopes very high here today. The left front is the one that's giving the problem. So, apparently, he ran over something during that caution period. The tire did go flat. He's going back now. He's going to stay in the lead lap, 
but can he do it not being in the draft? He's going to have to go like hell because he just crossed the start finish line as the leaders come on to lap, uh, come down to the start finish line. A right break. Which. A caution flag is coming out. That's going to save Kyle Petty. Allison whips across the stripe as they took caution, and Kyle Petty is redeemed from a one-lap deficit. As you look at Harry Gant, the in the bandit, car number 33, Harry, who had been leading, now is propped up in fourth spot right in front of Buddy Baker. Well, they brought that caution flag out for what looked like a piece of aluminium or aluminum, as you'd call it here, on the track right under the start-finish the start line and, of course, right under our box. But it was, in fact, a piece of silver tape, silver duct tape, which, of course, does keep Kyle Petty on the same lap as the leader. How very fortuitous the debris is on this track sometimes for some people. Sounds really odd as he went round here. Prisoners who have a good attitude get warm clothes and very good food. Yesterday won the uh, prelude to the 500, the Sportsman 300. Earnhardt winning with Jody Ridley second and Sam Ard third. So again, he has found victory lane after that very shallow season he had in 1981. The third place car on the track presently is Cale Yarborough. Maintaining fourth position is Harry Gant. Buddy Baker sustains fifth out here with 16 laps complete in the Daytona 500. That's surprising, Mr. Goodwrench. You mean a wheel alignment could really save me gas? Sure can, as much as a gallon a tank full. A gallon? Right. Your GM owner's manual recommends periodic checks. If your wheels need aligning, we can bring them back to GM factory specs in just a few minutes. A gallon a tank full? And we'll check your shocks and brakes, too, just to be sure you're rolling easy. Keep that great GM feeling. And save a gallon of gas. With genuine GM parts. It's kind of slippery. I'll be careful. Besides, we're not alone. Ah, yes. We've got the blimp behind us. The sisters may not know that Goodyear rolls up 9 million miles a year testing tires, but they sure like the traction they get. So, with the blimp behind us, our car handles just, just divinely. <laughs> get the blimp behind you. Come up to Goodyear. Oh, it's good to have friends in high places. Forty years ago in Poland, there were 500,000 people trapped behind it. There were only a handful of known survivors. The Wall, Tuesday. Ready for resumption under green. They are working the 18th lap. When they come by, they'll have completed 45 miles, and they'll be back in a green flag condition with Bobby Allison in front and Dale Earnhardt nipping away in second spot. Earnhardt, one of those Ford Thunderbirds, they have been drafting well, but they seem to be a little off when they have to run by themselves. Here they come, down for a start. Safety car circulates out of three and four, and we're just about set to turn them loose as we look out of Joe Ruttman's car another time as he moves to the line. Joe Ruttman's automobile coming down, running back in about ninth or tenth position now. and moves in behind number 71 another one of those seven That's stacy safe. cars in the track they're lined up like on parade those stacy mobiles that was uh, marcus who went around the outside of rutten as they went to the triable here and they made up two or three spots there a, making a very good uh, restart this way. joe rutman has a valentine to his wife attached to the automobile as you look at it there it says hi harpo that's his wife and kids. Happy Valentine's Day <laughs> from Father Joe at better almost 200 miles an hour as he it heads could around only the speedway. happen in America. <laughs> Allison still first. Earnhardt still locked to him in second place. And look at this 20 car freight train down in turns one and two. Well, an old bumper loss doesn't seem to less it weighed about 200 pounds. 
quick weight loss, but it seems to be not affecting his car too badly, but I can't believe it's as good as it should be. There's Bobby, Bobby Allison, Allison, the man up in front in the white and green car, number 88. Kel Yarber there, number 27, running in third spot. He's going to be a tough guy to beat today because he's been running consistently well all week, but hasn't been making a big show of it. I can tell you, won his uh, qualifying race on Thursday. I wouldn't be, if I was a betting man, I wouldn't be uh, keeping him out of my mind. Just look at that freight train now. And Buddy Baker in that red car this race and an incredible time of 177 mile an hour average i tell you these fans have got something to watch today and to cheer about up in front it remains bobby allison in car number 88 holding that lead from dale earnhardt in the ford as they go down the back straightaway allison driving a buick just on the point but here comes the thunderbird down to the inside as they go to turn three just clipped the wall and it turned three. A light touch, but I'm sure he touched it. Look at this. Oh, 26 car drafts that comes across the start. Here's Harry Gant's car. Number 33. He's running in fifth position. Gant now in fifth spot. Out of his back window. You look at Terry Labonte staring into his rear view mirror. Here's Labonte trying to move to the inside. Harry Gant throws him a block, stays up in front, and here they are in that long back straightaway where, if you dare, you take a breath. Now we have Kale Yarbrough going in first, Allison the second. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. Ken, we talked at the top of the show about A.J. Foyt coming back here today after that injury. Donnie Allison is in a similar position. The folks watched on CBS from the World 600 last May when Donnie was injured, and this is the first race that he has run in since then. We're standing with Harold Fagan, who's the crew chief on that car. Harold, have you heard from him? How's he doing? Oh, uh, he, he used to talk to me on the radio. He says everything's going fine. The car feels good. He said he's just going to sit there a while and, and ride and try to stay with the lead pack. And then if we're lucky enough to be around you know, 100 miles to go, I think he'd be right to take it. Has he said how he feels? He feels good, you know, and he's happy the way we had a lot of problems early in the week with engines and stuff. We've got some good engine in there now, and Everlyn's going good, and he's pretty confident. He just wants to sit and get his bearings after, you know, his wreck and all that. And I think, you know, like I said, if, if we're around with 100 miles or 200 miles to go, I believe he'll be right up there running. Well, time will tell on that, but Ken, he, like A.J. Foy, was very anxious to get back in a race car. Back they come to the tri-oval to complete the 23rd lap. Right up around 192 miles. 700 pound cars. It was Gary Smith that wrote Velocity times mass equals awe. Boy, it's short through here in this Daytona 500. Allison still in front. Yarborough in second. Earnhardt maintaining third. We have an engine going in turn number four. Car slowing on the outside. Rather, turn two. On the outside of the second turn, a car began to lose an engine and slow down, and I think it's car number 13. That's Richard Brooks's car car that David Pearson drove last week in the Bush Class. There we see Richard Brooks. So that's Ford. another Ford. His car didn't run really very well all week. He hasn't been very, very happy. On the other hand, of course, I'm sure he wanted to stay in the hunt in this race. That last lap was about 191 miles an hour. So these guys really aren't hanging around. If they get a long 20 or 30 lap run, oh, uh, that's a better view, isn't it? Oh, no, sorry, there we are. Bobby Allison still leads in Dale Earnhardt. Boy, I bet Dale Earnhardt's feeling happy today because he had a terrible season last season. And Bud Moore hasn't won all that many races over the last decade. And they're looking very, very, very strong here today. And they did in the qualifying heat on Thursday. There is Joe Rutman chasing Daryl Waltrip once again. What a square off they're having. That big freight train. And I mean big one. First to 24th position. How about this? First to 24th. Five and four tenths of a second. Here's Larry Huber with the report. We are in Dale Earnhardt's pit. This is Bud Moore, the crew chief. And Bud, when Donnie Allison ran over that debris, it affected your machine too, did it not? Well, on the lap before, there was a piece of metal that came off right at the start finish line, and uh, Bobby Allison ran over it without no rear bumper and throwed it through our windshield on the right side. So uh, we all have a small hole there. We're hoping it don't give any trouble. But we're prepared to put a windshield in if we have to. Well, Ken, they're watching it closely, but as all the crews have, there's a spare one right down here. 
but of course it's a time-consuming job and it's one of those things that if it happens on a caution and you can get it done and it's a good long caution fine but otherwise of course it would be a tremendous uh, nuisance another 192 mile an hour lap. Dale Earnhardt tucked right in behind Bobby Allison Earnhardt looking for his seventh career win Let's have some thoughts from Brock Yates here as we complete 26 laps and what we have seen thus far. Brock? You know, Ken, we always talk about the young lions in this race and how sort of fantasize about how youngsters are going to come here and run with the veterans, but hard fact is it's just not possible. It usually takes from five to seven years to get to run with the leaders in this league, and if we look back over the past decade, we've really only had three superstars enter the ranks, uh, Waltrip, Bonnet, now Earnhardt. But we've got one out there now in sixth place. I think the next man, the next big candidate, that's Terry Labonte in car number 44. Terry's starting his fifth year in this racing league. He's got Jay Gilder, one of the finest chief mechanics in his pit. He's got a good car owner. He's got a lot of money. And he's getting more and more experience behind his belt on each lap. So I say if that car keeps running, watch out for Terry. He is now running up in the sixth spot in the Buick Regal that was entered by Billy Hagan, a Louisiana entry, in this 24th run into the Daytona 500. Here's Allison, looking awfully good. He looked terrific out here in the Bush Clash a week ago, that incredible 50-mile, 20-lap shootout among all the pole qualifiers of the winners of the previous season. This car number 88 just ran on a rail the entire distance. Second place on the field continues to be Earnhardt. Holding on to third, Daly Arborough. Then comes Buddy Baker in the red car in the fourth position. And as you can see, these guys, there's Richard Petty uh, at the moment, who's way back in uh, 20th place about. And he's in the second main group. There's the front lead group. We see a side-by-side -side situation here. Basically, that front 14 cars have stayed together in single file and have managed to pull themselves away from the second group of uh, eight cars, in which is uh, Richard Petty and Elliot Forbes Roberts in the road race. are probably doing better here than he's ever done before in car number 96. That's the grandstand. In that lead group, right at the back there, is car number 62. That's the guy who's done very well this week, and that's Rick Wilson. Uh, he finished seventh in the qualifying heat, and he's running in that front group right now. He's right at the back of it, but he's hanging onto the lead group. First to 14, one and eight tenths of a second. Less than two seconds between first and 14th, as Dale Earnhardt of Kannapolis, North Carolina, in the Bud Moore prepared Ford, a change from a year ago for Dale Earnhardt, stays out in front. Allison about a car length, two car lengths behind him in that second place as they wheel to the fourth turn. As they come by, they are completing the 30th of the 200 laps. Let's go back inside Joe Rutman's car. Joe Rutman running in the eighth position. Joe Rutman described the eight and ten car drafts through the banking of Daytona Forest earlier this week. Here's what he said. It's, a, it's just a phenomenal feeling. It's uh, you just it just 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 pulling you along, and the car as you get further back in the draft, uh, you know the car is is controlled more by air than by, by the driver's uh, steering wheel. So uh, as far as uh, uh, the feel is concerned, you, you're somewhat helpless in, in certain situations as you get further and further back in the draft situation. The car is is the air is taking the car versus maybe you driving the car. Joe Rutman in eighth position, directly in front of him in seventh is the car number 11 as they sweep around a lapped automobile Tommy Gale down on the inside of the track and now you're looking out the back of the automobile as they continue to keep the hammer down around lap cars Butman running in eighth directly in front of him Waltrip in seventh neither has ever won the Daytona 500 there are the men up in front Dale Earnhardt stays first Allison works in second Yarborough third but look for a change right here David Allison yet again takes the lead away from Dale Earnhardt. They're just sort of playing around there at the moment. They've got an awful lot of laps to go yet, 170 odd laps to go. Uh, so winning these laps really doesn't count for an awful lot. But of course, the idea of the draft is that if it helps you to get together with somebody, if they keep on passing and repassing enough, they could just make a break on Buddy Baker, which would be absolutely great in the event of a, of a caution uh, period. Or, of course, in, uh, in a pit stop situation. They can pull away. That is 
suit them just fine. Jim Sauter is staying right up with the leaders. He's a protege of David Marcus. He comes out of Nittica, Wisconsin. And this guy, Sauter, Sauter has been running off and on a little Grand National Racing, but for the most part, he races out of the Midwest, David, on the half miles in what they call ARCO racing. And Dave Marcus has been saying for a long time somebody should give him a chance. Finally, Stacy did. And thus far in the race, he's staying right here in the lead draft. He is, in fact, he and Rick Wilson are, are bringing up the back of that lead draft, but the fact remains they are still with it, and that's the key. The Goodyear Blimp America giving you these amazing pictures of this Daytona 500. There were 120,000, they estimate, have gathered under perfect conditions today to see the running of the great American race. This tradition, this classic, actually goes back to 1901 when they first raced on the beach. Ransom Olds and the Winton Bullet went head-to-head -head at 57 miles an hour. Here's Larry Newbert. Well, a year ago, if you wanted to win a pole, you hired Jake Suitcase Elder, but Jake, you found a home with the, a home with the Levante team, haven't you? Yeah, right now, I think we're really good, smooth, and everything. I hope we do good this year. Well, Jake, you crew chief for some of the very best in all of stock car and NASCAR racing. How do you stack up Terry Levante against some of those all-time greats? I think the boy's going to do all right because he's just like the rest of them young drivers. He's got a lot to learn. Ken Terry's only win in Grand National Stock Car Racing has come on a super speedway just like Daytona. Jake Suitcase Elder, who in one year worked for seven different teams. Now there's number three. That is the Richard Childress car that is being driven this year by Ricky Rudd. And it's a tire change, as you can see. And that's going to hurt his chances today. Now you can see the crew chief there through the window, rapidly working away. He's obviously jacking some weight into that car. He's not very happy with the handling. And that's one thing they can do on these NASCAR cars very, very quickly in a pit stop situation. But on a green, I don't know. Average speed in the last uh, 10 laps, in the last 20 to 30, was 191.898. 191.898. Now we see Dale Earnhardt currently leading this race, or has been for the last two and a half seconds. Like the bat having taken away from again by Bobby Allison as they sweep into turns one and two there. 35 laps complete, 165 remaining. There is Earnhardt slowing down dramatically in the back straightaway. I wonder if he's running the fuel. Something's amiss and looks like a tire may be going down in the car. Oh. Very unstable. And everyone's passing Earnhardt up. Well, I think he's just checking that out. I think he might have run out of fuel, and he's doing that to get fuel to the tank. Uh, bunch becomes the thirsty bunch out here. They should be pitting in about the next eight or nine laps. Well, they should be pitting now, 30 laps, 35, 36, but if he's run out of fuel on that 35, that's not a very good omen. True, well, because nobody pitted in that first caution period. See, here's Neil Bonnet. He's coming into fuel as well. So it's obviously time for the fuel stop. So overestimating car number two, uh, Earnhardt, number 15 Earnhardt, to his old number, now being used by Joe Rutland. Here is Earnhardt coming on to pit road. He was able to squeeze enough fuel in to breathe it down onto the pit road. Let's go to Larry Newbert. Well, Earnhardt comes to a stop. Not too much panic with the crew. They're checking right side tire. Fuel is going in. There was very little conversation among the crew members as Dale was coming in. The crew members were obviously a little surprised. Dale was in communications with his crew chief, and now the engine is stalled. They are having one heck of a time getting it to refire. The engine is definitely dead. Now it refires. A little bit of quick start being sprayed inside the carburetor to the vents on the top of the hoods, and finally it fires off when Earnhardt is back on the racetrack. But he's gone a lap down. Now Joe Rutland, who had been running in eighth place, is in as they clean off the windshield and fuel that car. There you see that new netting that they put in these cars this year. Let's go to Ned. If these are scheduled pit stops, most of them will change right side tires, fill it up with gasoline, as they did on Joe Rutman's car, number two. He's now out on the way. We see Father down pit road there. Richard Petty is in for his scheduled pit stop. You know, some of them might not have taken into consideration that they ran a couple of laps under the caution before the green was actually thrown before this race got underway. It's my opinion that some of them are stretching it a little bit too far, and I think that's a definite case with Dale Earnhardt. He just went one lap too many, and it could cost him. Bobby Allison has slipped back into first place with 38 laps complete. Buddy Baker running in the second spot. Kaylee Arborough maintaining third. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. As J Jim Sauter was coming in, Ken, he got blocked in, almost crashed into another car that was coming out of the pit, but he used his head and got the, the car under control. They're changing the right side tires on his car. And Bill
filling it up with gas, but that little extra time it took him to get into the pits is going to hurt him, and he was running in that lead drought. Well, he had a bit of a contretemps when Donny Allison, they came in, and there was a bit of an after you, Claude, no after you, Cecil business went on, and that obviously cost him valuable time. But the one that really lost valuable time was Dale Earnhardt, who ran out of gas, coming off turn two, managed to close back to the pits, but he lost the full half lap on his coast business, and then, of course, uh, he had the pit stop on top of that. So he'll be well out of the hunt right now at the moment. Here's Harry Gant coming on pit road. Number 33, Gant. He's the bandit, but running right up in that lead draft. Taking on right side tires. Morgan Shepard's car is having trouble firing on pit road. Now, that's Elliot Forbes. Oh, sorry, Elliot. He was doing pretty well, too, old Elliot. One of them in big road races. Now you can see already on Harry Gant's windscreen as he goes into that afternoon sunshine that the windscreens here at Daytona particularly get sandblasted. You know, the whole of Florida is just a giant sandbar, really. And uh, Daytona's no exception, and it does start to pit these screens. So if we want in-car shots, we really want them early in the race, because later on they're going to be very difficult. Bobby Allison, who has been leading, all of these pit stops taking place under green. Kelly Yarborough is in. Terry Labonte is in. Parsons. Here's Ned Jarrett. Bobby Allison is in for his schedule pit stop also, and Ken, they're only changing the right side tires, putting in gas. They're not paying any attention to that rear bumper that's gone. Of course, it didn't seem to affect you too much. A very quick pit stop for Bobby Allison, but you can see the back end of that car has certainly been over. Buddy Baker now finds himself in first place. Going into the second position, Darrell Waltrip. And going to third, Dave Marcus, with fourth, Kaylee Arborough. Here's Baker getting ready to make his pit stop as Richard Petty continues to meander around the speedway. He has stayed out of that thick battle up in front. Baker, the current leader, comes in, and right behind him comes Darrell Waltrip in number 11. There's a good look at Buddy Baker. Won the fastest 500-mile race in the history of motorsports right here at Daytona. At the same time, Waltrip is in. Here's Ned. Yes, another quick tire change, Ken. I believe that's the fastest pit stop we've seen. Darrell Waltrip, the Junior Johnson crew, really got the job done in about 12 and a half seconds. And Darrell Waltrip, in fact, overtakes Buddy Baker as they leave the pits to lead Buddy Baker out of pit lane. And up there into the back, he turns one and two. They hang out the board for Ron Bouchard, about to make his pit stop. 41 laps are now complete. 41 complete, 159 to go, 102 and a half miles down. There we see, well, we don't see, so Buddy Baker going down the back straight. There we see three Stacy cars together, the Stacy team, number 19, number 71, and just in front of them is our cameraman, Joe Rutman. Gary Ballou is on the move in number 75. He's come from 31st. Now, he came dead out of the rear from about 33rd position up to fight with the leaders all day yesterday. And there is Dave Marcus, the new leader, number 71, Wausau campaigner out of Wisconsin. And his protege, number five, Jim Sorter, just right in front of him. And right behind him is uh, number 90. That's Jody Ridley. And here is car number 30 taking on some fuel at this point. Is the Roy Smith car, and this car was sent by the town of Victoria, British Columbia. They raised thirty-five thousand dollars to bring Roy Smith down here and represent Canada in this race. He's been here on previous occasions, a very fine driver, and he is the Western champion of NASCAR for the last two years. So Dave Marcus now is the leader with these pit stops. AJ Floyd and Richard Petty continue to slug it out, but they're playing a waiting game at this point. 71, Marcus up in front. Richard usually waits till about halfway. And there is the Petty car checking on the uh, positions. Richard Petty's automobile was still back in 30 and 40 laps at a 17 position on the overall field. Marcus stays out in front. Dave Marcus has four wins in his career. And most of them came in 1976. He won three races for Harry Hyde, including Talladega. Here's Larry Newbert. Well, Ken, one of the young lions who is getting a lot of conversation today is Rusty Wallace out of Missouri. Rusty is one of those drivers who performed well with the USAC and ASA stock car circuits before moving to the Grand National Stock Car Circuit. Rusty came rolling down pit road, very silent, and 
very somber in the face. He sat in the car for about 30 seconds. The crew looked under the hood at only free play. They buttoned it back down and pushed the car back behind the garage. Rusty Wallace, a big disappointing day. Running for rookie of the year this year. 40 laps, 100 miles complete. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. Dick Brooks was one of the victims of the race here a little bit earlier. Dick, what went wrong with car number 13? Something inside the engine. I think we'd probably burn a piston. We'd been kind of playing with a carburetor all week to, you know, to try to get it a little bit faster. We might have got it too lean. Now, Dick, number 13 has been a superstition. You were driving a white car with green numbers on it. Green has been a superstition. Think that had anything to do with it? What do you think? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't know. There's, a, there's some red and white ones out there running. And there's some green ones out there running too, so uh, I don't know. I think it's uh, I think it's just a superstition way deep down uh, on the surface. I'm kind of like everybody else, you know, a little bit superstitious. But... Well, better luck next time around. Happy Valentine, Mom. How what they say? Dave Marcus has pitted and he is coming back on the track and the new leader. Car number 88 and Earnhardt is running very slow on the bottom of the racetrack. Yeah, they took a long time to start that car in pit lane. Maybe it, just, maybe it just ran out of engine and not fuel. Problems for Dale Earnhardt. There's Harry Gant in car number 47. And right with him is Jim Sauter in the overall complexion of the race. Uh, brother Ron Bouchard in the car that Harry Gant drove a year ago. That number 47 running in the seventh position overall. Number 98, Morgan Shepard has come back on the road. Leaders come into turn number one. Dale Earnhardt struggling to get back on pit road. Number 21 is in that lead group now. 15 appears to be overheating. You say there's steam from the right front corner of that automobile. Here are your leaders gathered up on the back straightaway with the oh. white and green, number 88 in front, and the maroon and white, number 21, the Wood Brothers colors, the Warner Hodgson car, with Neil Bonnet of Hueytown, Alabama, goes into first. And Dale Earnhardt, unfortunately for him, goes into the garage. What a disappointment. Dale After Earnhardt. Bad year last year, not getting up to a very good start in 1982. Seventh retiree from the race. Millican, Speed, Bodine, Harvey, Brooks, Wallace, Earnhardt have all retired. Here's Larry Newbert. Well, I am in Dale Earnhardt's pits, Ken. Two years ago, Dale Earnhardt was the national champion. A victory yesterday in a sportsman race. He had to be very optimistic about today, but apparently engine problems, bud. What went wrong with the car? Well, we ran out of gas, and uh, I think that's why it started detonating. We blew a head gasket, so uh, we're having to park it. You were pretty surprised about the lack of mileage that you got out of that first load of fuel, less than 90 miles, right? Yeah, we, we figured we could go 100 miles uh, with all the caution, but uh, it didn't work that way, and uh, we'd go stretch it as far as we could, and uh, we just stretched it a little too far, and it ran it lean, and it blew ahead, gas going kind of running out of gas. Well, Ken, there were some new rules that were inst instituted this year about straps that support the fuel tank. The tanks are designed to hold 22 gallons, but the straps are reducing the amount of fuel the tanks actually will hold. They won't expand as much as they did a year ago. This might be something for the other teams to keep in mind. I think, well, I think what the strap does is it makes the tank make sure it does hold 22 gallons. They probably ran with a lot more than 22 gallons before. CBS Sports live coverage of the Daytona 500 will continue after this word from your local station. The pros are back, and CBS Sports Emmy Award-winning team will present the season's most extensive coverage of professional golf next weekend, the Los Angeles Open, here on CBS Sports. This is CBS. Now you can get moving in a new front-wheel drive Oldsmobile and get a cash bonus, too. Take delivery on a new 81 or 82 Olds Omega or Forenza by March 31st and get a $750 cash bonus. Make it a brand new Cutlass Sierra and get $500. That's right, a $500 or $750 bonus for retail customers contributed by Oldsmobile and participating Olds dealers. Apply it to your down payment or get a check directly from Olds. See your New England Olds dealer for a cash bonus worth up to $750. Nobody wants to think about inflation or life insurance on a day like this. But once you get settled, call a nationwide agent for details about inflation protection life insurance. It can help you take care of each other for as long as you both shall live. Inflation protection life insurance, part of Nationwide's blanket protection for you, your family, and your future. Nationwide is on your side. Look at sports tonight at 6 o'clock.
They've completed 50 laps, 125 miles, with Bobby Allison out in front. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. Dale Earnhardt just posted into the garage area. Of course, we heard from his car owner, Bud Morris, what happened to that car, Dale. But, boy, you had to feel off the bat about what did happen. I did, Bud. Uh, Ford was running real well, and uh, I was hoping we'd win a nothing for Wrangler down here at Daytona. And uh, just, uh, I think we blew a head gasket. It uh, ran out of gas about five, six laps before that, and we had to pit and get gas, and it might have leaned it out then and uh, caused it to burn a piston or something. Well, when he said win another one, he won the Sportsman 300 race here yesterday afternoon in a fine fashion at a uh, shootout down to the wire with Jody Ridley. Dale, 1981 was not a good year for you. After having won the Grand National Championship in uh, 1980, you felt that maybe starting right here today that this would be a turnaround for you. Well, I thought it would. The car was really working well, and uh, Bud and the guys had it working real real well and running well, and I could go anywhere on the racetrack I wanted to, and uh, Donna, uh, Bobby, and the rest of them was having the back out of the throttle going in the corner, and I could run in flat-footed, and the car was just going super. There's some hard racing going on out there. There are. Well, he's uh, able to smile a little bit, Ken. I don't know how after that big of a disappointment. Well, I, gotta have to as well. I must say it is terribly disappointing to be knocked out of a race so early. Uh, but Bobby Allison in car number 88 seems to have broken the draft with Joe uh, Rutman in car number two there and seems set sail to pull away. And as long as there's no caution flags and he can continue to do that, it's pretty bad news for the rest of the guys in this race. Kyle Petty on pit road, number 42. Again, another tire change on Kyle Petty's 42, and he's had his problems from the outset of this race. There's a Kyle Petty fan. That might be a Dale Earnhardt fan. I don't think he's anybody's fan. He's reading some book down there in the well, corner. Someone that's not running too well today, I'm sure. 50-lap run, rundown for 125 miles. Average speed, 148.466 miles per hour with Allison in car number 88 continuing to lead. And you're looking inside of Joe Ruckman's car now, the number nine car. He's back in 13th position and bustling by car number 18, Donnie Allison at this point. Back here he is in the tri-oval area. There he is going by Petty, Kyle Petty, who's just come back on the track. This is the automobile of Joe Ruckman. It certainly looks like uh, Bobby Allison's car he's following with that uh, with that bumper missing. Number three, that is Ricky Rudd with a hood up down there. Yeah, his Continue. car's been sounding pretty rough. Here's Larry Newbert. I'm with Waddell Wilson, Benny Parsons' crew chief, pole setter four years in a row. Waddell, Benny is not running in that lead draft. What's wrong? Well, the car is loose right now, and hopefully we can get a coach and tighten the car up to where he can run up front. This is a problem that you've had all week. Have you made major changes on the car? Was it a brand new setup for today? Well, no, this same setup we've run all week, but you know, in traffic, the car's loose. Ned Jarrett is at the other end of pit row with another one of the retirees, Rusty Wallace. Ned? Rusty from St. Louis, Missouri, one of the top rookie contenders this year. What went wrong? Well, early, early today when Joe Milligan crashed up there, I Got, got in this debris and cut a tire down. I had a pit for four tires and put me way down. But later on in the race, the rearing gear just started to expire. Just got hot and uh, we had a parking for today because of burned rearing gear. Rusty, are your plans to continue to run for the Rookie of Year honors in 1982? Yes, they are. It's a bad start right now, but it looks like Landon's going to be our next race. So we'll try to make it up there. Better luck next time around. Thanks a lot. Just to go back to what Waddell Wilson was saying, uh, Benny Parsons has had a worry all week. He's driving the Pontiac Le Mans, the same car that Bobby Allison drove last year in this 500. And you remember there was a lot of uh, contention over that car and the, and the height of the spoiler on the trunk lid. Those spoilers are vital for good stability and they've been given a spoiler that's an inch shorter than everybody else's. NASCAR say this is bad because the car's more aerodynamic and they're giving them that slight disadvantage. On its own, it runs very, very fast, as he proved in qualifying, but in traffic, he's been a little bit spooked with it all week, and now it's coming home to roost today. The car is loose. They've got to try and get that back end to play a little bit more by adjusting the spring weight. 12 cars are running in the lead lap. Bobby Allison currently out in front. Joe Rutman, Joe Rutman's car number two, hanging right in there. Latest rundown, he has pulled up through. They had him for a moment. There's a lap down, he's on the 13th. They're now showing Joe Ruffin in the second position with Labonte running in third. Terry Labonte holds on to third. Then Kyle Petty is a lap or two down. The number 42, which is running just behind these three automobiles. Rutman is really a dark horse. Big, lanky guy, about six foot four. All the Rutmans. Jim, who was here as a mechanic for his brother. Troy, who 
as we mentioned earlier, won Indianapolis in the early 50s, were all Giants. And there's Parsons in number 28, back in ninth position now, out of the lead draft. Right behind him is Morgan Shepard. All is Shepard who ran for Rookie of the Year last year and just got beaten out by Ron Bouchard. A very, very close run right down to the end. They both won races and they both won pole positions. Pretty unusual for two rookies uh, to do so well. 58 laps complete this time by 145 miles complete here in the Daytona 500 is Bobby Allison seeking his second win in the 500. Stays right up in front and the dark horse, Joe Rutman, stays right there in second spot with Levante in third. Fourth position overall is Neil Bonnet. Fifth position belongs to Cale Yarborough, while sixth is Darrell Waltrip, and here's Ned Jarrett. Ricky Rudd has pulled his car number three into the garage area, but he's staying in it. They're working on it. Rick, one more. I think something the valve train broke, but uh, just to make sure, I think they're going to change the distributor just to make sure so we can uh, go out and finish for the points. Well, he's hoping that he can get back in there, but he really doesn't seem too enthusiastic about it. Now let's go out to pit road where Larry Newber is in A.J. Fourth pit. Well, Ned, I'm standing in front of Jack Stiles, who right now is talking to A.J. on the radio. They've been talking about the last two or three laps about a variety of subjects. Number one, the engine is running fine. Number two, A.J. feels pretty good also. Their problem right now is looseness with the car. The car is not sticking to the racetrack nearly as well as A.J. would like it to be, and they're trying to figure out whether or not they should risk pitting on the green or perhaps hold out and wait for a caution. They'd like to come in as soon as possible. as the lead group swept by him. Yeah, there he is, the orange car, number 51, right at the back of this uh, lead group. As Allison, and Joe Runman, Terry Labonte, Neil Bonnet, and Cale Yarbrough continue to lead this Daytona 500. And A.J. Foyt's dropping back quite considerably. Obviously, a lot of these cars are feeling loose today. Loose means uh, that the back end wants to get away from you, and it can be adjusted only at pit stops. Let's go to Ned Jarrett with Donnie Allison. Donnie had to coast into the garage area. What went wrong? Well, Ned, uh, my oil pressure has been fluctuating real bad for about 15 laps. And, you know, as long as it wasn't going too low, I wasn't going to I wasn't gonna come in. And it started going down far enough for the light to come on. So I figured I'd better come on in before I closed the motor and they took myself out of the race with somebody else, too. How were you feeling out there? Well, I was feeling really good. I uh, My car got a little loose there one time, but Excuse me, when I could uh, get a hold of somebody, I could run real good, and uh, I couldn't run enough like Bobby in that front bus here, but we were, we were doing all right, and I felt like if we got this race on our belt, we'd get better. No uh, problems as far as any of the injuries you received last year in the World 600? When, when that green flag dropped today, really, how was it? Did, did that come back through your mind? No, not at all. I haven't thought about it unless you guys mentioned it. I don't think about the accident. Uh, you know, I got my work to do, and that's what I concentrate on. Did you have any apprehension about coming back? None at all. Did you talk to A.J. Foyt about it? You know, he yeah, had a similar situation. I, I, I kidded A.J. a little bit. I said, at least you and I got another chance. And, uh, you know, A.J. and I are good friends. I run an indie with him two years in a row. And he and I are good friends. And I'm just glad both of us are able to come back and do that. Well, Donnie has worked with us on some of our CA CBS telecast in the past. And, uh, of course, we're sorry to see you out of here today. Thank you very much. 61 laps complete. Bobby Allison still in front. Let's go to Rocky. is the best shape, whether it's a Ford or a Buick or a Pontiac. But today, we've got one Chrysler car running out there, a Buddy Erickson in car number 67. And believe it or not, there are a lot of guys in the garage area that will tell you that is the best shape racing car on the track. As it turns out, Buddy doesn't have as much power as some of the competitors. And of course, we know about Chrysler's financial problems, and we can only speculate that when and if some horsepower comes to that Chrysler, that number 43, for example. Right now, that number 43, Richard Petty, is running 15th overall on the 60-lap rundown. They are now working the 62nd lap. On the 60-lap rundown at 150 miles, this man, Bobby Allison, stays out in front with Rutland in the second position, Labonte in third, fourth is Bonnet, fifth is Waltrip, Six is Cale Yarborough. And there's the pictures from the second place car as Joe Rutman gets right in the draft of car number 88 and sticks with him to the 18 degree fly over as they come by to complete the 63rd lap of competition of the Daytona 500. 
Well, if he can just stick in there with Bobby Allison, he's in going to be in pretty good shape this afternoon because Bobby Allison's done so well all week. He really has, and these two guys are really putting to the rest of the field at the moment. We'll be back with more of the Daytona 500 in just a moment. Someday soon, you could very well have the best of everything. But you will have to begin somewhere. And the best place to begin is with the very best beer in the world. The best tasting beer wherever you go. When you think about it, why would you ever have anything else? Come to think of it, I'll have a Heineken. looking motorcycle we've ever built and if you think it looks good at a red light wait till the light turns green there's a time in life for the young to say i want something else a different way the town's the same the people too school is over needs something to do the services have it it'll really show you'll see new places you'll really grow in the army navy air force marines challenge adventure excitement too a time to enjoy and see something new army navy air force marines you'll work hard feel really free serving your country for all to see in the army navy air force marines be part of a team be friends forever a part of the services you won't forget ever army navy air force marines it's a great place to start Racing engines run hot. STP oil treatment fights the effects of heat in racing cars. Your car runs hot, too. In everyday driving, heat weakens your oil's vital protective properties. That's motor oil breakdown. STP fights motor oil breakdown. STP strengthens your oil, putting extra lubricants and anti-wear agents to work just where they're needed. Whenever you change or add oil, get STP oil treatment and fight motor oil breakdown. Coming up next on CBS Sports, coast-to-coast -coast rivalry as the Boston Celtics and the Los Angeles Lakers square off in NBA excitement. Be a part of the action next here on CBS Sports. You're riding along with Joe Rutman in second place. Just a Valentine's Day romp in the Daytona 500. You're traveling nearly 200 miles an hour. You see that picture? You're up the right of your frame. And right in front of him is the leader, Bobby Allison, number 88. The struggle is for first place between these two, and it's been that way for the past 20 laps. Meanwhile, attrition has continued to build. There you see the standings through 66 laps, with Labundi now in third, Bonnet in fourth, Waltrip in fifth, Caliabro in sixth, and there's the attrition. Twelve cars have now retired from the event. Twelve cars have fallen by the wayside. You see Donnie Allison out with engine problems, and just in the past moment, Dalbert Coward and Morgan Shepard have also had to come in. Now let's check on those cars running outside of the front four. That battle for fifth position continuing out there. There it is, cars number 27 and 11. The 27, the white, black, and red car is the MC Anderson entry with Kaylee Arborough, twice a winner here in this event, 1968 and 77, holding on to fourth position with the fifth position, Darrell Waltrip. Here are your leaders trying to draw away. Allison, also a former winner. And Rutman trying to upset everybody's apple cart. Here's 44 Labonte on pit road. Terry Labonte pulls down on a pit road. time for pit stops so we're going to see a whole rash I guess of pit stops on the green here but it is interesting that our camera car Joe Rutman car number two is really putting some distance between himself and Neil Bonnet. Here's Larry Newber. Terry Labonte is in. The crew was relatively prepared. They were not caught by surprise. It appears as though it was a routine pit stop. They changed right side rubber. That was the primary concern. The car got a new drink of fuel and Terry breaks it away. There we see out the back of Joe Rutman's car, that car right in the background there, that's Neil Bonnet, number 27, 21, who's running in third position at the moment. And here's Bonnet coming out of pit road. Number 21, Neil Bonnet, running in third, here's Ned Jarrett. They go to the right side to change tires over there, and of course, Philadelphia with gasoline. Two members are looking 
off the wall to see how the inside tires look, but their plans are only to change the outside tires. One of the fastest pit crews in the business, the Wood Brothers from Stewart, Virginia, and they have the way in 14 and 6 tenths seconds. The leader, Bobby Allison, being shadowed by car number two, Joe Rutman. Bobby Allison, winner of this race back in 1978, took the lead way up near the end with four laps to go. There's Joel Rutman. Look at those hands dancing on that steering wheel. Well, I tell you, you get a pretty rough ride around here. This banking looks smooth on this, uh, on this nice TV shot, but I tell you, when you get out there, it's pretty bumpy. 500 miles. 500 miles wrestling with a chainsaw out here. Rutman at number two in that second spot. Looks like his oil pressure's surging, if that's the oil pressure gauge on the far right of the dashboard when he went into the banking then. With the the gauge gave a tremendous lurch. With the CBS camera in the car, the question is, is it going to bother Joe Rutman having so many people along for a Sunday afternoon ride? I would say if I'm doing good, it wouldn't bother me a bit, but if I make a mistake, obviously, a few people are going to see. No, I think it's going to be interesting for, for people to realize that, uh, you know, there's a little more involved in driving the car, and, and uh, you're a little busier than a lot of people might anticipate, but, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we'll give them a, a, a good a good good ride through the whole race and do some passing and, and do some drafting and uh, maybe give them a little bit of excitement along the way. Well, he's he certainly be doing that. <laughs> he couldn't be doing better than he's doing at the moment because he and Bobby Allison are having a race on their own at the moment. And I know what he means about embarrassment, because last October, I had the same camera in a car in a race in Australia, and luckily for me, my co-driver got it stuck in the sand. <laughs> and there you had the inside view as they dug him out. 37-year-old <laughs> Joel Rutman stays in second. Petty dropping off to the inside and coming on pit road. One of those two cars. Here's Ned Jarrett. This is Kyle Petty coming, uh, Richard Petty coming down pit road for his regular stop. He drives the car number 43. They changed right side tires like everybody else, and filling up the gasoline, cleaned the windshield, cleaned the screen on the grill, give him a drink of water, and he's ready to go as soon as the crew gets ready. Uh, good and they're making a chassis adjustment on that car, too. One of the crew members reached inside and made a turn on the right rear. Hey, they're changing all four tires, a long pit stop, but a different kind of a strategy here for the Petty team. The others that came in earlier on the same outside tires. They are taking much longer, of course, to change all four tires than did the other teams. He's over 30 seconds now and finally gets the wave. That's going to put his way behind. Here is Joe Rutman coming out of pit road. Petty had been running in 13th position and in the lead lap when he made that pit stop. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. They're going to the right side on this one, Ken, and none of the crew members are even looking at the left side tire, so apparently they're only planning to change the right side right now. Now one of the crew members goes in, takes a look at the left rear, says it's okay. A good pit stop, less than 15 seconds for Dale Inman and the crew getting Joe Rutman. The Buick of Joy Rutman going back on the track as Bobby Allison leads and has a little bit of breathing room. The first driver to have any kind of breathing room in the 500 thus far. 73 laps complete. Eight different drivers have shared the lead, and they've swapped that lead 16 times while averaging 158 miles per hour. And one thing that'll give Bobby Allison a nice bit of room for comfort is he's put Richard Petty, the dreaded Richard Petty here at Daytona. What a love for Richard Petty. The seven-time champion of the Daytona 500. His father has won it to make it eight, and Pete Hamilton won this race for them in 1970 for the Petty team. Nine wins. Seven of 21 performances here, an incredible number. That's Richard. Of course, if you take into account his uh, firecracker 400, he's won nine times here, I believe. The number 88 of Bobby Allison, he's been here since 1961. 65 career wins for this man in Grand National Competition. As he passes the stands, he's earned over $3,218,000 in Grand National Racing alone. And he keeps mighty busy on the short tracks. Here he is in the Die Guard Racing Team, and you see he has a little bit of a little bit of breathing room over Haley Arborough in second place. Now Daryl Waltrip in third, Buddy Baker in fourth, and in the fifth position, riding fifth, it's Harry Gant. It seems a bit odd that uh, old Bobby Allison seems to go so far on a tank of gas compared to everybody else. Not that I'm intimating anything 
ungentlemanly. But he has gone rather a long time. 75 laps, 187 miles. And there's the picture once again. There's Ron Bouchard and Rutman squaring off here. Ron Bouchard, who won that incredible three-car dive to the line at Talladega, Alabama, in the Talladega 500 this past August on CBS. Remember that move? Labonte on the outside, Waltrip in the middle. Well, that yellow car with the Stacy livery was the car of Ron Bouchard from Fitchburg, Massachusetts, that won at the end of 500 miles by three feet. Bobby Allison is trying to make it anything but that kind of race today. Rutman trying to go down the inside. Here's car number one, Buddy Baker pulling in. Allison still out in front. Checking our position on car number two, our camera car, as he closes once again. Moves in after pit stops. Here's Larry Newber with Buddy Baker. Well, Buddy Baker is in. Here's the man who won this race just a couple of years ago. Once again, the outside rubber getting all the attention. Of course, every one of these cars needs fuel each time in. A lot of the crews are having trouble getting the fuel fill, cells filled. Now to Ned Jarrett, the other end of pit road. Here's Bobby Ned Jarrett. Allison, Bobby Allison, the leader, is in the pit. The routine pit stop for him. He takes a drink of that Gatorade that sponsors his car. They put black side tires, fill it up with gasoline, clean the windshield, and everybody else is done. Teddy is the only one of the front runners that took on all four. Now let's go back to Larry Newer. Kelly Yarbrough is on his way down pit road. The crew boots the wall. They're headed, of course, by Tim Brewer. The Jeff man, Barry Dodson, goes to work hiking up the starboard side of the race car. The windshield is being cleaned. And Tim Brewer, the crew chief, goes to work communicating with the driver, Cal Kelly Yarbrough. Cal, of course, won this race in 1977. A big race of fuel, and he's off now. Was successful in getting their fuel tank completely filled on the first set of pit stops. They got better mileage than the other top teams, and Tim Brewer told me he felt that was their advantage on the racetrack. Man. This is the second set of pit stops under green. Number 11, Darrell Waltrip, had appropriated first position. He is now making his pit stop right in front of him. Coming out is number 28, or coming in is Benny Parsons, who's been running right up with the leaders in 10th spot in the latest rundown. And we're getting the time here on the pit stop of Darrell Waltrip. Here's Ned Jarrett. They're changing right side tires on his car, too, Ken. And just a moment ago, while Phil Yarber was in, Harry Gant came in in car number 33, and they changed left side tires on his car, not the right side. A good pit stop for Waltrip. He is away and running. Yeah, he's away in 10 seconds. He's away a long bit more uh, Benny Parsons, our pole sitter. In fact, Benny Parsons' car is very uh, tardy in getting out of the pits. Kelly Arborough's number 27 back on the track as they pick up the positions after all of these pit stops. Gary Ballou is in, and I believe Stan Barrett's car is the next retiree. He would mark the 12th retiree from the race, and Mark Martin may be coming out. Bobby Allison is now being shown as the leader in car number 88 after the second set of pit stops in a green condition. The average speed through 70 laps. We're now at lap number 78. At 70 laps, 170 miles, 75 miles, 100. 158.570 158.570 Allison again has the first spot and with these pit stops number two Joe Rutman is finding himself back up into second place this is unofficial now in the third position to be the number 47 car and that's the yellow and white car prepared by Bob Johnson and Dick Beatty carrying Stacy cars that's being driven by Ron Bouchard in the fourth position Tom Sneva of Spokane Washington and who's been hanging on the lead draft, just staying around out there today. And the Indianapolis veteran is up in the thick of things at the moment. Well, Tom Sneva certainly is no stranger to speed. He's been one of the fastest qualifiers of all time at Indianapolis and the old Ontario Motor Speedway doing laps at over 200 miles an hour. So he's used to the speed, and this is the first year he's had a really good car, and he's hanging on there extremely well. 88, Bobby Allison. Can he win his second Daytona 500 and take that giant piece of the pie? Today is assessed at some $925,000. Here's his last lap average speed, 193 miles per hour, and that's by his lonesome, David. Well, of course, that shows the value of new tires. You see these guys changing tires very often these pit stops. Well, they're not worn out. They've got quite a bit of tire wear. They could probably do uh, at least 250 miles on a set of tires. But every time you put new tires on, there's just something about them that give you that little bit of extra speed. So for qualifying, for instance, they always run new tires. And there you see it right there. His very first lap out of the pitch with new tires, just on the right side only. And he turns it a lap at 193. They play musical chairs at the end of the season. This 
first car number 88 last year was driven by Ricky Rudd, who's now in car number three, and the car that's set on the pole this year, number 28, now has Benny Parsons at the keyboard. Allison was there a year ago. He's now tied into the Guard team, and that car looks strong. Now there's Tom Sneva in that white automobile, number 37, the Alexander car, and that one is running very well today. Sneva stays right with the leaders. He's been working his way along through the field from the start. A year ago, he came to Daytona and failed to qualify for this event. Now from Joe Rutman's car, Sneva is one of those cars behind him. They come down to the tri-oval. It's one of those white two cars in the back, the other one being Neil Bonham, car number 21. Um, when we just saw uh, Sneva a few moments ago, he was passing number 47, Ron Bouchard, who's just coming into the pits. It looked like he was slowing down rather early. He ran out of fuel as well. Bouchard is on pit road, number 47. Bob Johnson crew working on the right side. Here's Larry Newber. One of the family affairs entered in today's race is the Mark Martin crew. This is Mom Jackie, who watched Mark three times be ASA champion, but there'll be no championship today, will there? I said there'll be no championship today like there was with ASA, right, Jackie? Not today, but maybe next week. Were you pleased with the running of the car till the engine went? He was running a real good conservative race. I don't know what position he was in. Well, about two football fields away from me right now with the prodigy of Jackie is Ned Jarrett with Mark Martin. And he's one of the smallest drivers on the circuit. He only weighs about 125 pounds, 23 years old, but he can flat handle an automobile. But uh, what was your problem? Well, Ned, it was, as you know, it's my first time here in a Grand National race car. And, uh, we were pleased with the way we were running. Uh, we needed a caution to get four tires and gas and get caught back up with the lead draft. I was ready to race with the with the leaders at that time, right as we were, uh, we had engine troubles, what took us out, though. You're considered as one of the young lions are coming along in this sport. Do you see yourself that way? Well, like I say, Ned, we're learning on the super speedways. Uh, we're a new team, and uh, we're just going to try to get going at the next one in Richmond. Well, he will be a driver to be heard from, Ken, before 1982's over. Mark Martin, the 13th retiree from this event. He was running in 15th position, that 23-year-old, when he came out. Youngest driver in the race, 21-year-old Kyle Petty. 80-lap rundown is now being assimilated for 200 miles, 200 of the Daytona 500, and it shows 10 cars continuing in the lead lap with Bobby Allison out in front. Joe Rutman is being shown as second. Neil Bonnet is third. Terry Labonte, Darrell Waltrip holding down that fifth position as they continue to swap. Kelly Arborough is being shown at six in trouble down in turn number two. It's car number 59 up against the wall and sliding. Ty Scott of Penargo, Pennsylvania. His Buick automobile grinding off the front end and coming to a rest just out of turn two. Caution out around the speedway for Ty Scott. Scott making a singular performance here. He's not running the entire season. Just came down here in this car number 59 for the race. A Buick automobile and the 32-year-old Scott who's done a lot of short track racing in Pennsylvania. Fine dirt tracker. Gave a great performance here in 1979 when he finished six. Is now out of it. In the 84th lap, he crashes in turn number two. And we'll be able to show you what happened. Let's take a look now. Here's David Haas. Well, there's Ty Scott parked up against the wall, oh, but here we see the accident starting. Oh, I don't know what happened there, really. I don't think he was touched by that car underneath him, which was, uh, but he just, just seemed to lose control, shot across the front of that guy up into the wall, and now you can see him holding it up to the wall, which is the right thing to do in a situation like that, because this is the last place you want to come away from the wall and get T-boned by somebody passing you. Well, this will gather up the front of the field, those nine cars in the lead lap, and create another Daytona scramble. And from the car camera, we may be able to get another view of what happened. He's already in the wall as Harry Gant went down the inside, David. Well, Harry Gant's one of those guys that was lucky that Ty Scott did such a good job of holding the car up on the wall once he'd got it there. Ty Scott, whose best finish was fourth at Darlington in 1979. Came down off the wall, as you can see there, several feet. Just left away, but he, <laughs> he soon made sure he got back close to it again. That's where an English bloke hit the wall, you know, in about 1976. Just about the same place. H-O-B-B-S, as I recall. Oh, no. Upper Boddington Flash, they called him. Something like that, yeah. Surprise you a little? <laughs> it did a bit. The noise is so loud. <laughs> 
imagine grinding along a concrete wall for six or seven hundred feet might impair your hearing for a bit. It <laughs> sure does. Big, big moment on pit road. Everybody's coming in. Labonte is there. Neil Bonnet has just pulled in. Rutman is in. Allison is in. And there's not quite the pressure of the green flag stops we've seen the last two times. They're taking a bit more time to print and make them as proper as they can to continue toward the halfway mark. Well, this is the stuff, of course, that Benny Parsons wants to do some adjustments on his car. Uh, they're doing some adjustments on that car right now out there. We wa watching as they're getting in car number 59. Looks like it may be on fire out here. There's some problems. Let's go to Larry Newber. We are in Kelly Arborough's pit, and despite the fact we were in just moments ago, crew chief Tim Brewer decided to use this as an opportunity to top off the tank and to also change rubber on There's the car. There's problems on the track. Car number 59 is on fire. It is caught on fire, and Ty Scott is still in the automobile. It didn't look like he took such a hard blow, but they're having trouble getting him out of the car, getting some assistance, and there is fire in the automobile. What's happened? It looks like he might have hurt one of his legs, but uh, it didn't look that hard a hit, really. But of course, well, you just can't tell. Obviously, he is hurt, and he obviously couldn't get out of the car unaided. And it looked at one stage there as if the car was catching fire, and um, obviously, panic set in somewhat. Safety crews working with Ty Scott. We had a bad crash earlier this week in qualifying. Bill Dennis of Glen Ellen, Virginia, crashed hard here in the Trioval. He is now listed in fair condition here in the Halifax Hospital. At Daytona and the rest of the speedways in the NASCAR circuit, the key word of the drivers is not speed, but safety. Racers are constantly trying to make the track a safer place, and Ned Jarrett has this report. Over the years, NASCAR has had a number of innovations which have made it safer for the drivers on the track, and many of these things have gone on also to be incorporated into the cars, which makes it safer on the highways, such as improved safety belt situations, improved suspensions for the cars, and this year is no different. Remember last year this terrifying accident involving John Anderson? Notice his arm flailing out the window. Safety net didn't work. That car had this old-style safety net, which perhaps is not much stronger than a volleyball net, and it simply fastened at the top, and it came loose in that particular car, but now NASCAR has a new, much stronger net. It is actually bolted at the top, so it should keep the driver and his arms inside. But that's not the only hot item on the circuit this year. In the past, the hottest spot in the race car for the driver is where his right foot sits and depresses the accelerator. It's directly over the exhaust pipe, about three inches away, the temperature is sometimes 13 to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. They have burned big blisters on their feet in the past. It got so hot in my car that I got third degree burn on the back of my heel back earlier in the summer. It cooked the meat on the back of my foot and even went in and turned the bottom of the bone black. It cooked it so badly. In an effort to try to reduce the heat in the past, they've used duct tape, they've used plyboard, They've used asbestos and aluminum or a combination of all. Richard Petty even uses a buildup on the heat of his boots, but that doesn't seem to work too well. Now there's something new on the market. It comes from the NASA space program. It's a plyboard looking material, but it'll withstand much more heat than we've seen in the past. They would insert this beneath the floorboard on top of the exhaust pipe, so hopefully the driver's feet will be much cooler than ever before. 88 laps are complete as they bring in the Ty Scott automobile. We'll have an update on that story shortly. Still under caution here in the Daytona 500. The following performance is brought to you by the Champions Park Club Company. We are starting the 1982 performance season with over 197 Formula One victories domination of international motorcycle championships, worldwide use by major professional racing teams. Not to mention sure starts, good mileage, and smooth, dependable performance. Next tune-up, insist on champions. Champion wins the world over. Sometimes a simple river crossing isn't so simple. Your turn. Push. Head 
for the beer brewed natural as a mountain stream, for a taste as smooth as its name, Bush. Head for the Bush beer. Head for the mountains. If there's one tire that dominates America's racetracks, it's Goodyear's Racing Eagles. And now we've tamed our Eagles for the streets as an advanced line of high-performance radials. Eagle NCT, our ultimate performance radio. Eagle GT, already chosen as the optional radial on the 1982 Corvette. Eagle ST, with performance that belies its price. The Eagles, tamed for the streets, but far from tame. Some men never ride with the pack. Now, for them, there is the Nighthawk. A motorcycle so different, it looks like you own the only one. Looks like Jake's going home. I don't think so. Jake lives that way. The Nighthawk by Honda. Monday, two great comedies. Can Merlin's magic conjure up a dream date for Zack? Then Captain Lewis comes unbuttoned over missing diamonds on Private Benjamin. Monday. Under caution, they have now completed 99 laps. 99 are down to the 200 to be run. There you see the standings as Allison still dominates. Bond at second. Ruckman the surprise in third. Lamonti is fourth. Here's the attrition. Cars that have fallen out of the race. They now total 14 machines with Ty Scott, the latest victim of the track. His crash up there in turn number two has brought out this third caution period of the day. Let's go to Brock Yates. Ken, every time we have a crash at a race like this, uh, there are certain people away from the sport that will tell you that all these fans have shown up here to just see such a thing happen. In fact, they'll tell you that they want to see people in race cars hurt or even killed, and that's the only reason they come. Well, I say nonsense. I say, based on my years of experience in this sport, that these people come here to vicariously ride with these drivers, to see them encounter all sorts of adversity and a lot of hazard and a lot of danger. But they want to see them survive. It is the essence of this spectator involvement with this sport to see adventure, confrontation, and survival. When someone is hurt, Truly, the crowd is hurt. We've all been at races where people have been injured or even killed, and I don't think there is ever in sport a more awesome pall that is thrown over a large crowd than when a serious accident happens. And I can say that if anybody denies that, they don't know either motor racing or the people who enjoy watching it. The thoughts of Brock Yates. Now to Ned Jarrett. They have just brought... Ty Scott into the hospital area, Ken. Of course, this is a mandatory situation. When you have an accident of that sort, they bring the driver to the track hospital, check him over if need be. Of course, they'll take him to a nearby hospital where they have more facilities to attend to them. We understand that, uh, that they did, of course, carry him to the ambulance, but one of his crew members said he thought that he was conscious, but they are taking him into the track hospital here now, and we'll have a report as soon as we can get one on his condition. We've had another retiree just now, number uh, 94, Bobby Wolwack of Villa Park, Illinois, has just gone back behind the wall. He may try to come back out, but we have 90 laps officially completed, and we're now showing 14 cars have fallen by the wayside. Bill Gasway up there in the control tower. There's the map of the course, and there you see those, those indications around there are all the various safety units of the speedway. There's like seven or eight ambulances here, fire trucks all the way around the track, various vantage points. They have observers in each of the corners as well as down the straightaway to watch exactly what happens to these cars. Here's Larry Newbert. Sometimes the Wood Brothers, headed up by Leonard Wood here, have brought a car into victory lane here at Daytona. Is today going to be number five, Leonard? Well, I can't tell yet. The track's real slick out there, and the car's kind of slipping around a little bit, and we made a chassis adjustment, hoping that'll help it some, but uh, uh, Allison's really strong, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. What kind of secrets and tricks do you, does your team have up its sleeve? Can you reveal them? Well, uh, we're just trying to hang on at the moment. Uh, like I said, Allison's real strong, and uh, the track's real slick out there, and we made a chassis adjustment, and hoping that that'll help it. Would you rather be up there with Bobby Allison or with Darrell Waltrip when we come down near the end? Well, I, it just depends on which car is running the best, which one you'd rather try to outrun. Uh, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, 
we'd like to beat both of them if we could. Well, the Wood Brothers have never taken Neil Bonnet to victory lane here, but Neil hopes that changes today. As we look at the standings with 91 laps complete, we have a Buick in first, fourth, and fifth, and the real surprise is that Fords, David, are running second and third. You think the Fords have outsnookered them here? Well, I think that they've perhaps been uh, laying back a bit. Joe Rutten's been going all pretty well all the week, and of course Earnhardt was going extremely strongly in the week and in the race, and it looks like the Fords are going to be in contention at the end of this race, but as uh, Leonard Wood just said, old Bobby Allison looks very, very strong. There you see the race summary with now 92 laps complete, 10 different leaders, and 19 lead changes among them. The average speed at 154 miles an hour, nowhere near the record. The Wood Brothers with a second place car, number 21, Neil Bonnet at the controls. They've won this race on four previous occasions. First with Tiny Lund in 1963, Kale in 68, A.J. Boyd in 72, and David Pearson in 1976. A.J. continues to stay out here, keep running. Things have not been going well with the car. They're out of the lead lap at the present time, but the mere fact of his presence in this event speaks to the rugged individual that A.J. Boyd is after that terrible crash that he had at Michigan back on July 25th a year ago. It's a very long race, of course, for him to make his comeback in. 500 miles uh, around here at Daytona is very, very tiring on man and machine. And if he can uh, pull this one off, he's, uh, he certainly is indeed the Iron Man. But the big story as well is that Darrell Waltrip Jr. Johnson story. They continue to have that car number 11 right in here. They show up in that lead lap. They're running where Junior likes to run. You don't have to be right up on the point now, but you're right in there with them. And car number 11 in the latest rundown was being shown in ninth position, a correction, in seventh position overall. Waltrip was in the seventh spot and maintaining the eighth position directly behind him. As they line up bumper to bumper, Harry Gant and Ron Bouchard in ninth. In that tenth spot, Gary Ballou. And Ballou started 31st on today's field. What a rambler and scrambler that guy Ballou is. On dirt, he's incredible. He won in Syracuse, New York a year ago, and they said he never had that car straightened the whole race. He was sideways around the mile all day. Bobby Allison going for win number two in the Daytona 500. We're under caution, waiting for a further report at this time on Ty Scott. Take a fast look at Volkswagen's 82 Scirocco. As you can see, it's been totally redesigned. Take a closer look, and you'll see a lower aerodynamically sleeker front end, curved glass areas, and a functional rear spoiler for better handling and performance, all of which makes the 82 Scirocco one good-looking German sports car. The only problem is getting a good look at one. For dinner at Denny's, we take boned, butterflied rainbow trout from Idaho. Marinated in specially selected herbs and spices. Gently wrap it in seasoned flour. Grill it till it's flaky and tender. And serve it with a big baked potato topped with real sour cream. All for the special price this month of only $3.49. The Grilled Rainbow Trout Dinner. Only at Denny's. Where you'll like our prices and you'll love our food. Sat down with mom, talk to dad, can't get it together, makes you feel sad. You know you can do it, you wonder where. You want it soon, because you really care. The services can help you so you not only get better, you really grow. Talking Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. You'll work hard, they'll make you a man. Responsibility is part of the plan in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Prove you can make it, prove it to all. Serving your country and walking tall in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. You've got it together, they'll see in a glance. Thanks to the services, you got the chance in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. It's a great place to start. Head and Shoulders doesn't have it. Selsun Blue doesn't have it. Only Denerex has it. An extra relief medicine to stop dandruff itch. You can feel it tingle. All three have one medicine for dandruff itch. But only Denerex adds a second medicine. An exclusive anti-itch medicine many dermatologists recommend. You can feel it tingle. That's extra relief medicine. And only Denerex has it. In regular or new mountain fresh herbal, Denerex stops dandruff itch with an extra relief medicine. 
next weekend on CBS Sports. Be a part of the action. The all-out drive of NCAA basketball as Notre Dame takes the court against South Carolina. The quiet tension that overpowers the Pacific in the Los Angeles Open. And the lightning pace of NBA action as the Phoenix Suns meet the Philadelphia 76ers. The action continues next weekend here on CBS Sports. 94 laps complete, getting set for a restart with Bobby Allison first, Bonnet second, Rutman third, Labonte fourth, Tara, Buddy Baker is fifth, Yarborough sixth, Waltrip seventh, Harry Gant is in eighth, Bill Elliott ninth, Benny Parsons tenth. Joined eleventh right now is number 42. They're saying Kyle Petty. And let's go to Larry Newber quickly. Dale Lindman, Joe Rutman's crew chief, are you guys pleased with the performance of your car up to this point? Well, we've run real good so far in the race. They still about uh, quite a few laps to go, and uh, look like Bobby's the quickest car, and everybody's trying to hang on to him. We've been real fortunate so far to stay real close, and maybe we get a good finish out of it. Ready to go green, and the top of the pit road is Bobby Allison, Ken Squire. 13 cars in the lead lap as they get set to turn Thank them you. loose another time. Down they come through the third and fourth turn. You folks hit about 185 on the back stretch, don't you? Need Bobby Allison has a couple of lap cars directly in front of him. There's the light blue number 75 of Gary Ballou just in front of Allison. And the car up on the point is the number 47, I believe, of Ron Bouchard. Is that right? Just on the tail end of the lead lap. They are on the tail end of the lead lap. There's the 12th and 13th cars as they get set to go. Now we're back with Joe Rutman's car, number two. Remember, he's in three. Slower cars down the inside, David, and the fast machinery up in the outside lane. There we see Morgan Shepard, and there we see the other safety car of Jody Ridley, number 90, as Joe Rutman sweeps by as they go over the start-finish line here. Joe Rutman in that high lane, because he's number two in the race, uh, number four on the road, he's second, uh, third in the race. Bobby Allison. about to overlap. They're in the lead lap, both Ron Bouchard and Gary Ballou, but Allison sets his sights on putting them one lap down. They're not having it. Ron Bouchard and Gary Ballou don't want to be a lap down in particular. No, indeed. Struggling to stay with the leaders. Bouchard, Ballou. Allison just watches them out a little. Remember, these are two relative youngsters to Grand National Racing his shot he wants to know exactly where they're going to go yeah i bet he does 195 mile an hour you want to be very sure that you know where they and you want to be sure that they know that you're there there's rutman dropping down on the inside of the dave marcus car marcus is a lapped automobile running 15th remember rutman number two is in third and there's allison dropping to the inside takes blue and he goes after Ron Bouchard of Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, puts him a lap down, and here comes Neil Bonnet on the inside. Neil Bonnet being sucked through there by uh, his friend Bobby Allison. Uses the draft from Bobby to pull himself underneath Ballou and Bouchard. Leaving out the goal, number two, our cameraman, who is still stuck behind those two cars. And this is the perfect setup for Allison. His protege, Neil Bonnet, another member of the Alabama gang, is with him can be sure those two have intentions of breaking away from the rest of the field. They possibly can. Rutman needs to make a move right now if he wants to stay with them. Rutman has to get past Ballou and Bouchard, unlapped himself, and then uh, put a lap down on those two and really get up with uh, Bonnet and Allison because in this business, these two are two of the absolute best. And Bobby Allison. Bobby Allison up in that front position. He's won this race one time, Cale Yarbrough's won it twice, Richard Petty, a phenomenal seven. Allison trying to change the record on the little here today. Rutman and the 125-mile qualifiers went from first to eighth position in the length of a short straightaway, one of these short shoots, and he got trapped outside the draft. Here's a 360 shot all the way around the speedway from the plane, as you see them. Going down into turn number three. Looking like beads on a necklace as they wheel around up on that 31 degree banking. Doesn't look very steep from there, does it? It's look, flat. At, look at that number one, that red car in the middle of the pack there, very, very close to the wall. That was Buddy Baker in the car number one. Just some idea, too, of the multitude. 
to gather for this festival of speed at Daytona. Joe Rutman still stuck behind uh, Ron Bouchard and Gary Bullo, although I suppose stuck would be a very good word at 195 miles an hour. Halfway this time by. 100 laps down, 100 laps to go. Richard Petty is running a lap down. The latest report had him at 18. Had him at 18 for Petty. But I still wouldn't count him out. He's <laughs> been a lap down here on occasion to come back and want it. Halfway indicator. Harold Kinder puts it on him. The blue flag, of course, uh, he was waving there with just some of the slower cars. It's the, it's the passing flag. That uh, a faster car is coming up and you must let it fly. That's the theory, anyway. So there are the standings, 250 miles into it. Still holding on to the draft. Following along, Joe Rutman trying to work his way through those lap cars. CBS Sports live coverage of the Daytona 500 will continue after this word from your local stations. On WKRP, Les falls in love with a working girl. The oldest profession. The range of farmer. Then the two of us pose as a married couple to cool off man's old flame. Wednesday. This is CBS. We could have had us one of them Honda Civics, but this Colt by Mitsubishi seats five, not four. And she gets terrific mileage to boot. Colt's got this dandy twin stick, too. For your fuel economy, just... Leave her be, but for a scotch for giddy up, kick in the stick. Hey, Go by Mitsubishi, master car builders of Japan, imported only for Dodge. Get a coat and get a check for 300 bucks. Now, is that a kick? For Valentine's Day, your participating Carvel ice cream store has Cupid the chocolate nut. Yeah, he's back. And the twin heart cake in Bordeaux cherries, isn't that something? Now, these products, folks, are made custom, handmade, fresh in your Carvel ice cream store. Want to send one to a friend in the Northeast or in Florida? Please phone the toll-free number that you see here, and we honor most major credit cards. Thank you. Striking Oil, a special series starting Monday on Eyewitness News at 11. CBS Sports Special is sponsored by the complete line of STP performance products. The Miller Brewing Company, brewers of Miller Highlight. If you've got the time, we've got the beer. And by Yamaha, motorcycles designed to be as different as the people who ride them. per hour, 250 miles into this event, Bobby Allison in his quest for his second Daytona 500 victory. Following today's Daytona coverage, stay with CBS Sports for great basketball. Two of the NBA powerhouses tip off as the world champion Boston Celtics, led by the all-star Larry Bird, take on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's L.A. Lakers. Join Dick Stockton, Bill Russell at courtside right after the Daytona 500. CBS Sports. Trouble going into turn number one. A smoker blown in. Oh, and a spin. I think uh, that's Neil running up in the wall. And Ron Bouchard has landed on the bottom of the racetrack. On the top, it looks like Benny Parsons as well as Neil Bonnet. Richard Petty's 43 all torn up. The seven-time winner, Richard Petty, with a front end badly blunted. And 96 is in there as well, Elliot Forbes Robinson. A major crash in turn number one is bringing out the fourth caution period of the day. There is Neil Bonnets, number 21, trying to win this race for the Wood Brothers once again. Trying to get their fifth win. Leaders coming back to the line. Petty is out, Bonnet is out, and I believe that Benny Carson, Parsons' car has sustained damage as well. And I think from inside, 
of one of our cars that have those in-car cameras, we're going to be able to witness exactly what happened here. This is Harry Gantz, number 33. I'm sorry, that is Joe Rutman's we number two automobile. We see the action's already started up there. And you can see the sort of visibility, stuff coming up to the windshield there, bits of debris. This gives you just some idea of just how close. He passes Neil Bonnet scraping along the wall. Which Rutman absolutely blessed. Bonnet scraping along the wall, cars diving to the inside. Petty is out of his automobile. And aren't we thankful he's okay holding his nose a bit. Neil Bonnet is down there with him. And we have this from another perspective. Now there's the car losing an engine. It's the car losing an engine that caused the whole thing, isn't it? And then they get in the oil. And away they go. It was car number 94, and he's been going around very, very slowly for the last three laps. And I'm pretty amazed. I was about to comment. I couldn't understand why they didn't black flag him. I've no doubt they'll be wishing they had now. Ten figures. I'm up here all day. You're here for five minutes. 106 laps are complete. The leaders are all back on pit road. You saw Richard Petty walk away from his automobile. He seemed to be all right. Son Kyle, we have another. Let, let's look again as we watch them try to get Neil Bonnet out of his car. Let's see if Neil Bonnet is okay here for a moment. Trying to extricate yeah, Neil Bonnet. I think he's okay, yeah. He seems to be all right, doesn't he? From the in-car pictures taken by Joe Rutman, look again at what he faced. He had to be trembling a little right here. While he's coming down the straight, he sees that engine blow right up the front of this high-speed draft. He comes up close to the wall, into the smoke screen, and then out of the smoke screen comes that debris as it bounces off the windscreen. Two cars in front of him, one starts to spin, or the car, there's two cars in front. The car right in front of him manages to hang on. Miss Neil Bonnet is up by the wall. There's another one spinning down at the bottom there. In fact, that's the car with the blown in. There's the flames coming off Neil Bonnet's car as it scrapes along that outside wall. It's just a, a flash flame. There's Kyle Petty that's tucked in behind our camera car of Joe Rutman. And they're all very, very lucky, but it just shows the inadvisability of letting these old crocs continue to run. Bonnet being picked up and put in the ambulance. Let's go to Larry Newber. Well, in the Richard Petty pit, Wade Thornburg is the main man. And Wade, any radio communications with Richard about the accident? Well, all thing he said he was okay and the car was totaled out. So, did that number five hit him in the rear, did he hit the head on into the wall down there? So, did Richard see any evidence of a blown engine or anything else going on around him? Uh, he didn't say nothing about it. He apparently had no warning then, did he? Must not have. He said he was in good shape, like number five hit him. That was it. Well, there'll be no eighth victory today in victory lane for Petty Engineering, and right now, Ned Sheriff has an update on the Ty Scott situation. We've been standing by to get a report here, and a member of Ty's family has told us that he is in good condition, that he is conscious, but he has a concussion. He's in x-ray right now. He says that there are no broken, broken bones, and there were no burns from the fire when the car caught fire while it was still sitting out there after the accident. So it is a good report. The doctors, of course, are going to be busy here this afternoon, it looks like, and we will await Neil Bonnet coming in for his checkup. The field is running its 108th lap in the 106. A serious crash has demolished four of the serious contenders in the 1982 Daytona 500. Cooled V twin engine, monoshock suspension, shaft drive. For those who appreciate the difference between acceleration and exhilaration. Clear. I guess it's Miller time. Last one down by. Right. Miller time. Time for the best tasting beer you can find. Miller High Life. When it's time to relax. What took you so long? One beer stands clear. Miller beer. If you got the time. We've got the beer. Hey, over here. 
Charlie should have known trouble was coming. He had warnings, hard starting, hesitation, stalling. STP gas treatment might have helped. It tunes up your gas for better performance. Used regularly, it keeps water from building up in your tank, helps clear your entire fuel line, and cleans your carburetor for better mileage. Satisfaction guaranteed. Don't wait for the warning signs. Get STP gas treatment and tune up your gas. Here comes Harry Gant and the Skull Bandit in for a pit stop. Hi, I'm Harry Gant. When I bring the Skull Bandit in for a pit stop, I come in for a paint stop. Because while the rest of the team takes care of the bandit, I get to take a little pinch of skull, put it between my cheek and gum for real tobacco pleasure without lighting up. Now that's what we call teamwork. And skull's what we call team pleasure. For real tobacco pleasure without lighting up, try skull. A pinch is all it takes. Under caution, and there's one of the stories of this Daytona 500. A.J. Foyt in number 51 is back. He is now running in 15th position on the field after a serious crash in turn number one. Foyt out here after he himself survived one of the worst crashes of his career a year ago. The Daytona 500 is a special race, but for some drivers, it's more special. And A.J. is driving competitively for the first time since that crash at Michigan seven months ago. A.J. Foyt, in the world of auto racing, he's one of a kind. The only man to ever win the 24 Hours of Le Mans 67, the Daytona 500, 1972, and the Indianapolis 500 four times. That distinguished career nearly came to an end last summer when A.J. hit the wall in the Michigan 500. The crash was sheer terror. He had cracked his helmet. They talked of amputating his right arm. They said 46-year-old A.J. Foyt had seen his last race. To me, it was pretty bad. Uh, I was just glad I didn't lose my arm was the biggest thing. I lost some muscles that uh, was actually torn out on the racetrack, I guess, and it's got a screw all the way through the elbow now. It's uh, given me quite a bit of pain. Uh, yes, it does have a lot of soreness at night after I work out with it and things like that. Uh, the elbow gets real sore. As the arm improved, he faced the trying question of whether or not he should return to the track. I says, do I want to come back or do I just want to own cars? And be truthful with you, I really don't feel I have nothing to prove, but I still enjoy it. My doctors, they've all jumped on me and says, you know, AJ, you can't be hurt many more times. Keep surviving. I says, well, we all got to go some way. So he left AJ Foyt's car lot to the salesman and A.J. Foyt's horse ranch to the stable boys, and A.J. returned to the garage and his four-wheel toys, which have brought him happiness and enjoyment over the years. I just feel like I just want to go back racing and run a quite a few of them and get back in shape and get to feeling good again. You know, laying around and trying to heal up just makes you old, tired, and fat. So I figured get back in the racing and get back in the swing of things. Back on the track, A.J. geared up for the competition, and his priorities changed. He not only wanted to prove he could come back, but come back and win. Racing is still my first love. And when a driver's out there, it's a team effort, but yet the driver has to call his own shot. Uh, he can't call in on the radio and shall try to get under this guy this lap or what have you. And I think that's one thing I like about uh, driving a race car. You, you got to call your own shot, and if you're man enough to do it, you're man enough to be a winner. A.J. Foyt. Running right up there are the leaders today. And they said he wouldn't be back again. Any fan that's ever seen A.J. Foyt run at Winchester, Indiana, or Indianapolis, or any place he'd ever been, could have told those doctors the same thing A.J. told them. Yeah, well, A.J.'s pretty tough, and you've got to be pretty tough in this business. And uh, one of the other people that's got to be tough, I sometimes tend to think of the officials. They sometimes come down with a very heavy hand. Then another time, they don't come down with a heavy hand. And this was this whole accident, four cars here, written off because of uh, softness. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. Well, they have brought Neil Bonnet and Richard Petty into the hospital area. Richard is still standing out. You can see him in that crowd. Now he goes into the hospital. He was talking with some people, but he was limping as he went in. Bonnet was on the stretcher as they took him into the hospital. We'll get a report as quickly as we can and get back on their condition. I believe that man standing there in the uh, white shirt is the uh, father of Ty Scott, who's down here with him today. They've had a lot of cars that have run on the dirt in Pennsylvania. 
and there are three cars, and there's one fan that is not concerned about what's happening here on this Valentine's Day. Much busier with whatever it is Mom gave him or her. Still under caution, a late word from Ned Jarrett. Robinson was involved in that accident also over there, Ken. He, he was, came to the hospital and then walked right out. Apparently, you're okay. Yes, I'm fine. The, uh, I just hit the wall trying to avoid some of the debris on the racetrack. Well, what caused it? What started it? Well, I don't know. I talked to Richard Petty on the way back because he was up front. And he said it looked like somebody blew a motor in front of him. Everybody slowed down when he got on the brakes. He was hit from behind, and that put him around backwards, and he hit the wall. And it seems he hurt his foot uh, a little bit uh, badly. It's swelling up some. Well, Lee Petty, Richard's father, had just come out of the hospital. Lee, what did you learn? Well, about? I went in there. It looks like somebody spun down there, and he hit, somebody hit him right in the back, and he drove him right in the fence. And I just got through talking to him, and he hurt his foot. But I believe he'll be able to plow tomorrow. You think he'll be able to plow? They're going to put him right back on the farm. Now, boy, I'll tell you, if that isn't uh, humor or... I don't know what, well, how I, you do it, you I fellas. Th I think you'll be able to plow tomorrow. <laughs> okay, well, we're certainly happy that you can smile about it and that Richard Petty is okay. We'll get a report on Neil Bonnet as quickly as we can. Thank you very much, Ned. 112 laps are now complete. The 110-lap rundown had the speed at 144.126 miles per hour. Bobby Allison still secure in first place. Terry Labonte is in second. Joe Ruttman hangs right in there in third spot with Darrell Waltrip now moving the Wizard Mobile up into fourth spot. And Jimmy Sauter in fifth. And we're going to take a careful look at Jimmy Sauter's car as it comes by here, David, and see if we can spot any damage to the front end. Richard Petty was saying he thought he took a shot from car number five as they were getting on the binders going into turn number one. I would think that if he had taken a shot like that, that it would definitely show in that car. Now let's take a look at the attrition as we look at the race summary. The attrition now builds to 18, and sadly, it includes Benny Parsons, the man who sat on the pole and wanted so much to win this race once again. Elliot Forbes Robinson and Richard Petty, the grand champion, 195 career wins, seven times a winner here at Daytona. Neil Bonnet now out. One lap, and they're going to be back under green once again as the battle continues out here on the speedway. And with everybody ready to thump bumpers and rub fenders, we get down toward the finish of this one. We're 113 laps in of this 200-lap event. We have eight cars running the lead lap as we get ready to resume. Again, it's Allison in front, Labonte in second, Rutman with our cameras running third, in the fourth spot, Waltrip, the national champion from a year ago. Then in fifth is Jim Sauter, and let's go to Larry Newbert. When the 1980 winner, Buddy Baker, came in the last time, the hood went up. Hoswell Ellington, the crew chief, why? Well, what happened, you know, that they've been trying to get that guy in for, you know, out there smoking for so long, and he blew an engine right in front of the whole pack. He wasn't running but 80 miles an hour. And so we got into it and blew two tires. And then when he come off the bank one day, he stretched the tie rod in, so we had to set the toe in again. And beat, out, and beat out all them fenders and all we got to wreck. Buddy apparently noticed that the other uh, car was running slower. You guys felt it should have been flagged in earlier. Oh, yes, that's no difference about that. Now, he, 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 they black flagged him three or four laps before that, so he didn't pay any attention, kept out there, didn't blow the engine. Probably wasn't running 80 mile an hour. What they should do is never let him back out in the garage area when he goes in. He's been in there twice. Well, the driver we're talking about is Bobby Walwack, and Ned Jarrett is on pit row with Bobby right now. Ned? Bobby, you had uh, a problem out there, but you didn't feel that the oil came from your car. No, it blew, lost the piston and blew some oil under the headers and made some smoke, but I was way down. I saw the leaders come, and it was down on the flat part of the racetrack, and uh, there wasn't any oil from my race car that caused anybody to get slippery. Well, he should know because he brought it on into the garage area and there was not much of a problem. Neil Bonnet is okay. He is conscious and talking to the people in there. Hopefully, he'll be out of the hospital before too long. Restart moves to the line to start the 114th lap. Buddy Baker is now a lap down in 12th position, incidentally. Green flag is out. On the outside, Joe Ruffin goes all the way up to the wall as he tries to squeeze through. Rutman is right up there, wheeling around some lap cars as they muscle each other going into the first turn. Now there's Rutman, battling his way as he tried to make that maneuver to get around those lap cars, and he's pulled around them. Joe Rutman in third position, and closing down the back straightaway. Great move on the start by Rutman with our CBS camera on board, giving you live pictures right up there among the leaders. Well, there he is, of course, he's following uh, Larry. Levante is running second, who's just right in front of Levante is uh, Bobby Allison. And of course, uh, the 
Stacey team at this stage is doing extremely well. Right behind Brutman is Gary Ballou, car number 75, and he's a lap down. And behind him is our other camera car. No, it isn't our other camera car. It's Darrell Walton, number 11. Waltrip running at fifth position. Two back from our camera car in third spot. And there is Harry Gant. That is the Wizard Mobile, not Waltrip's car. Built by Chuck Gay, and you're looking out of the back of car number 33, running in seventh position. Running right in the seventh spot. Talk about close competition. It's everywhere around this speedway. Look at that hood flushing on the car behind him. It just shows you the air that's falling, that's uh, blowing that hood around at those tremendous speeds. These cars doing about 195 down there. Sitting in there looking pretty relaxed at the moment. There's Harry. I think he's moving around in on A.J. Foyt now. A.J. Foyt's car number 51. See those little puffs of smoke coming off A.J. Foyt's right rear tire as he goes over those bumps in the banks and turns uh, three and four right up to the wall as they come into this trial area. Marcus, who has been running up in ninth, is in to make an unscheduled stop and come back on the track. That's going to cost him dearly. Back up in front, there are your leaders. It's Bobby Allison, still in first, the Nygaard Racing Team, the Gardner Brothers car, right up there holding on with LaFonte making a great run in the Billy Hagen car in second place. And then in third lies Rutman. Field down the back straight away, and in, from inside, the CBS mobile unit where Bob Fishman and Bob Stender are doing such a remarkable job of bringing you this one of the most difficult sports events to cover and the technical crew we have here has been superb it's nine hard rugged days to get this 500 together and bring it to you and nobody has missed a beat since it began coverage today I have to think it's among the best we've ever been able to give you and certainly one of the, the most remarkable history one of the most remarkable things when you go into that truck He doesn't see any of these cars. All you see is the only way you can recognize the cars half the time. Back straight away. Allison in front. Lavante in second. Running third, Joe Rutman. 117 laps down, and here comes Waltrip. All right, Darrell Waltrip is beginning to show some muscle in the Junior Johnson car number 11. He's on the inside, and he's beginning to haul the mail. Here he is, working underneath Joe Rutman as they come back to the tri-oval. Room and he's bringing along with him Gary Ballou in that blue number 75. Right behind him, that looks like Cale Yarbury, car number 27. It is. He's running fifth spot at the moment. It's a great intimidator. Gerald Waltrip, who has been oh. the car in trouble, sliding in front of the field. Two that's, cars getting tangled. That's Gary Ballou and that's Cale Yarbury, car number 27. I don't think either of them hit each other very, very hard, though. They could both just get away with that. There's Baloo they, driving off. They don't know how lucky they are. I'm sure they do. I know that Cale Yarborough does. But Baloo, that was right where Johnny Anderson apparently looks like he just got caught in the draft and it went away on him. And Johnny Anderson flipped about eight times. That is the exact same spot where uh, Cale Yarborough spun, if you remember, the year of his dramatic finish with Donny Allison. They spun there early in the race. Tire down, flat tire on uh, Baloo's car. And Cale Yarborough is back underway. He looks like he's got a couple of flat tires. I've got his car all down there. Not sure if the tire went down first or after on Baloo's car. Now, let's look at this replay. There's his car back. It looks like it just got away from him. Kale's coming down and down and down, but then so is Baloo. Kale decides to go high at this stage, but just clips the back of Gary Baloo's car there. If he'd tried to go high in the first place, it would have been better for him, but, of course, that's pretty good 2020 hindsight at this stage and sitting up in this booth. Kyle Petty running 13th just squeaking by, as you saw, and there's Buddy Baker getting by. And we have it from another angle. We have another vantage point for you to observe what happened here. To number 27, who was running six at the time, Kaylee Arborough, right into the side of car number 75, Baloo. Maybe Baloo cut a tire down. Could have a lot been, of smoke yeah. off that yeah. right rear side as he went in there. I can't believe he would just flat lose it. Baloo is a super tough driver. He is a protege of Pete Hamilton, who won this race back in 1970, and Pete, as his mentors, had a great deal to do with the car and the way it works. Now we've got another massive onrush on the pit lane, and we've got a tra traffic jam down there with uh, Harry Gant. There's, there's Terry Labonte, who's still running right up on the top of the race, and I'll tell you something, David, that Jim Sauter, who you mentioned earlier, number five, he 
continues to stay up in here. He's in fifth place overall. And the guy that couldn't get a ride, Dave Marcus kept telling car owners, this guy can get it done. And nobody would believe him. Well, here he is. Jim Stacy gave him a shot. And so far, he's been pure magic out here. Well, he's only, he hasn't got a, a regular ride for the year. He's one of those guys that a lot hinges on today. And he's going to want to do as well as he possibly can. Well, there's Cale Yarborough, two-time winner of the Daytona 500. Winner of one of the 125-mile qualifying races the other day, checking out the front on his automobile. It's good to hear that Richard Petty is all right. Perhaps a little racetrack arthritis tomorrow after meeting the wall at 190 miles plus per hour. But uh, he's going to be okay. And there's smoke out of Cale's car. Reminder of upcoming NASCAR Grand National Races on CBS Sunday, June 20th. One of my favorite tracks, Two Mile Bank. You can pass anywhere on it. Roger Penske's beautiful facility up there in Cambridge Junction, Michigan. The Michigan 400 right outside of Detroit. That has always been a great race. Last year, the winner came from first to eighth on the last lap to win it. And then, of course, Talladega. What can we tell you? You've been there the last two or three years. 13 different races, 13 different winners, and last year the winner took it by three feet. And this man, number 33, Harry Gant, figures to be a winner sooner or later. Last year, seven second places. Time after time, so close, but never coming through with that number one position that he so much wants. He's never won a Grand National race. He has over 2,500 races to his credit in sportsman and modified races. And you're with him right now, the bandit, handsome Harry Gant in the Burt Reynolds, Hal Needham, car number 33 Buick, coming on the track. Here is Cale Yarborough, who, as you saw, was having trouble coming back on the pit road, sawing on that steering wheel a bit. I think his left rear tire's flat. Here's Larry Newbert. We are in Cale's pit the last two times by the crew. About half anticipated him coming in, but Cale was in communications with crew chief Tim Brewer, not only on the telephone, but they were also communicating via hand signals each time Cal came through the trioval. Now they anticipate changing all four tires eventually on this caution flag. They just made the decision to change all four on this stop. There was some thought that they might stop twice, depending upon how long the caution flag was and how efficient they were, and they got the right side change. Ned Jarrett with the story at the other end of pit road. Well, we're happy to see Neil Bonnet walking around out in the garage area. Neil, uh, are you okay? Yeah, just a little bit sore. Richard was in the hospital while I was in there. He's hurt the top of his foot. He might have broke the top of it. I don't know, but it's sore. But Well, Neil, here is the accident. As you went into turn one, can you tell us what happened? Can you pick yourself out? As we went in there, we saw a car blowing, and there was parts and pieces flying everywhere. And Bobby held his hand up, and I held mine up, and we slowed down, and somebody hit me in the rear. And as it did, I turned in the outside wall, and it pulled my right front wheel off, and I couldn't... I didn't have any brakes, plus I couldn't get the car to off the wall. It just had the wheel turned all the way back. And, you know, after that behind there, I couldn't tell. But the thing that started, it was a car blowing, and there was parts and pieces hitting the cars and windshields also. We lifted, and somebody just, you know, come in there and was fun of all it. It's just a tight deal racing that close. Something's going to happen. And it looked like the car was really working for you. Well, I, it's one of the few days I've had enough sense to sit there and ride and not extend the car. I had a whole lot of race car left, but I, we saw all week long that I had to live off the draft, and I was going to sit there all day long and wait to the very end to see if we could win the race, and there's a lot of good race car tour up there now. Neil, uh, Richard Petty, was, you mentioned, was in the hospital over there, too. Of course, you talked with him. Were there any other of the drivers over there? No, I... Richard and I were the only ones in the hospital, and before I left, I went by and talked with Richard for a few minutes, and he said he's okay. There. He's probably going to go get some x-rays made of his foot, but he's feeling okay, you know, right now. Well, that's the story from the garage area at the moment, Ken. 122 laps now complete. No report on Richard Petty, Kelly Yarborough's car. They say there's a tire rubbing on that one. More shortly. I've had to write some tough things about some tough guys. But there's one guy I can't write anything bad about. His unique brand of baseball has made him a living legend. So have his commercials. They got me to try his favorite beer, light beer from Miller. Light's less filling and it really tastes great. Ready for a restart. In second place, you're riding with Joy Rutman. In front of him is Jim Sauter from Wisconsin. Rutman from California. Go at it for first place. one lap down and that's oh Dave Marcus 
Marcus in the other car just touched there as you see him going through turns two and three. That's his protege, Marcus in the white car on the inside is running wheel to wheel with the man he brought into Grand National Racing. Now on the outside, moving by the lap car of Dave Marcus. Actually, Marcus just at the tail end of the lap, running back in ninth. It is Jim Sauter, father of 11 children. With that Buick, Camry out in front, the Wisconsin driver right in that area, winning a whole lot of races over the past several years, finally getting his break. And you see how close they come to that wall there as they come up turn four, ready to come into the triangle here. Jim Sauter right in front of Joe Rutland. Sauter won the Automobile Racing Club of America's event here in Daytona, 200 miles, back in 1979. Little signal as he went by the pits from well, Joe I Rutland. Think, I think that little hand signal from Joe Rutland was to, uh, for the car following him to catch right up on him to help him drop. Here they are, side by side, and now Rutman is going into the lead. Upland, California, as Joe Rutman goes into first, but here comes car number 11 down on the inside. Well, that's what the hand signal was, I think, was to Bobby to come right close, and it, and it pushed him close by um, Zana's car. Oh, Waltrip making a move as he came, diving onto the rear bumper, down the inside. Johnson in the Wizard Mobile, and look at Rutman fight that wheel going into turn number one. Through the tri -oval, all that air, all that instability in the front end of these 3,700 pound, 200 mile an hour cars. Bobby Allison just seems to be able to lead this race at will. He's shown tremendous form all week, and boy, is he showing some form today. Jim Sauter falling back to fourth position. New maneuver. Terry Labonte coming down the inside. The Corpus Christi, Texas driver, winner of 37 of 46 races a few years ago in Texas. He's making his move. Look at them, side by side, swapping paint as they come out of turn number four. And there you see them, absolutely side by side through turn four. You can see how close those cars are together, and there's Darrell Walton right behind Joe Rutman. Now remember, all of this is at nearly 200 miles an hour. They're not kidding out there today. The real McCoy. The great American race as Waltrip and Rutman and Labonte. Jim Sauter continue to swap it around. And Allison, of course. Now you see Darrell Waltrip going down the inside again to try and take the lead away from Bobby Allison. Goes around Rutman and he goes after number 88, Allison. This could be a nice war. Bobby Allison first, Darrell Waltrip now second. Rutman drops to third. We're 127 laps into the race. Just 73 to go. Talk about hanging on by your fingertips. Look at those cars as they come through that trioval and that vantage point from inside the car gives you an idea. The front end just seems to skim along the ground. The drivers say sometimes you have no sensation of the front wheels being on the ground when you come to the well, top very, that speed. In those very close drafts, of course you don't. It does make the front of the car very, very light. Bobby Allison is back in front. But the Wizard Mobile, built by Chuck Gay, the only car of its kind, rides in second. Bobby Allison in number 88 stays right there with it. And number 33 is the, I keep calling that car as it was last year. 33, running in fifth spot. It's the Chuck Gay creation, the only new car in the race. Thank you, partner. It's a sort of wizard mobile because it's built by the old wizard, Junior Johnson. And uh, he, too, is one of the wizards of Grand National Racing. But look at these two heroes here now. Bobby Allison, number 88, Darrell Waltrip, number 11. Really starting to shoot it out now as we're getting down in the closing stage of this 500-mile race. Average speed at 141.472. A lot of caution laps thus far. The last one, extensive time, five laps. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. Richard Patty is walking out of the hospital right now. You can see him getting in a van, uh, Ken. He does have a foot injury. They're going to pull him through to the garage area. That you can see a fence between us and him. They're going to pull through here, and we're going to get a chance to talk to him in just a moment. We're resuming the point battle on that $8 million NASCAR Tour right here. One year ago, Allison had the national championship tied up midway to the season, led by some 340 points. Now, there's Harry Gant's car. And there's the picture from inside Gant's automobile. Running back there, fifth, sixth spot. Back straight away. Allison thought he had the national championship.
championship won, but at the end of the year, it was Waltrip in number 11 who put it all together. Back to Ned Jarrett. We rip Richard Petty. Richard, you got your feet sort of bungled up here a little bit. Well, what happened, uh, you know, when all the wrecking and stuff was going on, uh, I slowed down, the boy hit me in the back, and when it did, it went down the flat, and when it hit the wall, and that's why I had to push the brakes just as hard as I could, and I run head on in the wall, and it just sort of turned my foot back, and uh, we're going to go get an x-ray, but I think it's okay. It's just swelled up a little. Richard, how did you see the accident happening? Well, you know, we was back in sort of a second packer, and, and uh, somebody blew just as they started, uh, you know, right before they got to the corner, and there was so much smoke, I think everybody just started slowing down, and... Uh, Again, I slowed down, and when I did, somebody hit me in the back, and if they had hit me in the back, I'd have been okay, but I think that's what happened mostly. Well, Richard, 1982, you came here with very high hopes after winning it in 1981. You and Kyle both have been running strong all week, but uh, it didn't really go according to plan. This just was one of those days. Kyle's had a little bit of trouble. He's run pretty good. I didn't really run that good, but I had enough trouble to, to keep it from doing good. And, uh, you know, we'll come back next year and try it again, but uh, we won't give up. We still got a long year here. And I'll bet if there's any way possible, you're going to be at Richmond, Virginia next Sunday. I'll be there if I have to drive my left foot. <laughs> well, that's the way they go about it, Ken. Well, I expect Bobby Warwack will be very relieved to hear that it wasn't his oil that uh, caused the crash. It was just the impenetrable smoke screen he laid down. Kyle Petty is now in 12th position. Well, there's the picture from Harry Gant's automobile running up in fifth. George Gravio is on the controls of this camera. You see, he can actually maneuver the camera around. He can move the camera as they pass. It's all by remote control from back here, actually behind the grandstand. You're watching Joe Rutman go down into the trioval area. And there's the pan over to him, driving. Just moving, now he's moving that camera back so you can look out the front. It's pretty incredible. They can pan it, they can uh, refocus it, and they can zoom it. Consultation flag is out for Kale Yarborough, uh, for uh, Kyle Petty. Kyle Petty coming in. There was some smoke coming out. They were reporting smoke out of car number 42, and they're underneath the hood on Kyle Petty. So for the folks from Level Cross, this is not a good day. A.J. Foyt continues to hammer away out here. He's running 15th, number 51. 133 laps complete. Bobby Allison, a run average speed of 140 miles per hour. Waltrip stays second. And running in third is Joe Rutman with Terry Lamonte maintaining fourth. The fifth spot is Jim Sutter. There's Richard Petty's car, and the front end sure doesn't look like it did about two and a half hours ago. Well, he took a pretty good shot at the wall, and of course, as you said, you know, when you see an impenetrable smoke screen like that, there's just no way normal human being and these guys are normal and they don't sometimes you've got to lift off and of course in a situation like that where you're drafting within inches and someone lifts off uh, the gas uh, trouble ensues and of course we've lost through inefficiency really we've lost four of our best runners eight cars running the lead lap the ninth car is Tom Sneva one lap down now here come your leaders back in the fans view we see Allison first Waldrop second then in third, Joe Rutland, followed right on the rear bumper by Terry Lovati in number 44. Back on the 31-degree banking, stretching those cars out. Fifth spot is Jimmy Sauter. Sixth spot is Harry Gant. From the blimp, you're watching them now. Seventh is Cale Yarborough. Cale did not lose a lap, and there from the Goodyear Blimp America, you watch that front freight train running down to the banking another time. Last lap at 193.133 miles per hour. So they're getting with the program. Now, Jimmy Sauter's car apparently has been reported to be starting to smoke. Uh, we'll have to have a close look as he comes by this time. He's running in a really good position. If it is smoking, it sure isn't smoking very much. Uh, unless it's smoky on the banking, maybe the tire's rubbing. Thirty-eight laps complete, just 62 to go. Consider this. Of the 42 starters, 21 are now out of the race, and we still have a freight train up in front. Dave Marcus is the latest retiree. That's 20. 20 down at this point. Nearly half the field has been disposed of thus far. Those 139 laps, 347 miles complete. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. The latest one to have problems here today is Kyle Petty, the other member of the Petty family. Kyle, what went wrong? 
Well, I guess it uh, sucked in a, a intake gasket or something like that. We thought it was a valve cover when it first started smoking, but uh, I guess it just sucked the gasket down in it. And uh, I mean, you know, it started smoking, and it wasn't no use to keep running because it was going to keep going all on the racetrack. And we was going to create a dangerous situation out there. Well, you had high hopes here too. <laughs> well, yeah, we'd run good here all week and uh, run good the first of the race and cut a tire and got a got a lap down right at a lap down and still was able to keep pretty much a by ourselves we had to run by ourselves to catch up with them but uh ended up a lap down but even when we were a lap down we were able to run with them so uh it was all right I guess. well as larry newber said earlier it won't be for the petties today and now larry newber is with junior johnson on pit road well Ned, there's only been one man who's ever won this race as both the driver and a crew chief not the same year and that's junior johnson he had the car that was virtually unbeatable a year ago this is not really the car you preferred to have on this racetrack the one that's racing in the race today though is it junior well, we built two different kind of cars this year to bring here. Well, I feel like about a, about a week of getting as much work into it as we'd like, and uh, that's a car that we didn't bring here. I think the car we got here is, uh, you know, a good car that should win this race. Although, you know, we had a lot of expectations for the other car. Uh, I, I can't say anything bad about this car. Well, Ken, they say this is not their first line car, but he's still in it for, for the victory. A.J. Floyd on pit road. Super Texas back out. Oh, he's what's that? Please. Problems on the car running 15th on the field. Also understand there's a windshield that's cracked on that car. Continuing to fuel car number 51, and that's costly for A.J. Foyt. Locked up his right rear really badly as he slid down pit road. But unfortunately, he just lost another lap on the lead group. But what is really interesting is at the back of this lead group, running in seventh spot, is Cale Yarbrough. Now, can you believe the wile of the man? He spins coming off turn two, manages to get back to the pits while the caution's on, gets the whole thing sorted out, changes four socks of tires, has the bodywork pulled off the uh, tire, and still is in the lead group really working the caution flag to the absolute nth degree, causing it and then still staying with the leader. Allison the leader, Waltrip in second, Joe Rutland stays in third position while maintaining fourth is Terry Lavati, Jim Sauter hangs on in fifth. The dream team is to make their move. The country that just built the world's fastest train also builds the world's best-selling front-wheel drive car, Renault Le Car. From the French who can give you comfort at 230 miles per hour comes exceptional ride, handling, and interior room in Renault Le Car. So why drive an ordinary car when you can have this extraordinary car at a most extraordinary price, under $5,000? Le Car by Renault, where great engineering lives in great design for under $5,000 at Renault and American Motors dealers. This Bud's for the guys who make our engines purr like a kitten and roar like a lion. This Bud's for you, for all you do. The King of Beers is coming through. Yeah, just for you, that distinctively clean, crisp taste that says Budweiser. For all you do. This Bud's for you. Fit, feeling good top to bottom. Here comes Wrangler, and he's one tough customer, and he knows what he likes when he sees it. Goodyear took the radial tire and made it right for American drivers by making it all season. Built for sun, rain, snow. Radials that eliminate winter tire changeover from Goodyear. Goodyear has more experience making all-season radials than anyone else in the world. So why buy a conventional radio when you can step all the way up to Goodyear all-season radios? Goodyear. Quality and innovation. The pros are back, and CBS Sports Emmy Award-winning team will present the season's most extensive coverage of professional golf next weekend, the Los Angeles Open, here on CBS Sports. 
just completing 146 of the 200 laps in a dead heat for first place. Junior Johnson and Darrell Waltrip, the dream team, begin to show their muscle a little and try to fight their way in. It's Waltrip up on the outside. They've held back, held back. Now they're making their bid in the late going. Here's Joe Ruttman with our camera car going to second place, falling back Bobby Allison. This is when you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Here's a report from Larry Nuber on A.J. Foyt's car. Well, one of the men responsible for changing the rubber in A.J.'s car is Cecil Taylor. Cecil, the last time in, you changed no tires. Why? Uh, A.J. just didn't feel like it was necessary. He said the car was working pretty well the way it's running. Uh, we just went for the fuel and get back out. More action at the other end of the pits with Ned Jarrett. And a happy fellow here, Robert Harrington, who is the team manager for J.D. Stacy Operations, and he's the crew chief today on Jim Sauter's car. You got him up there running second and third, and Sauter is doing a way of a job out there. Well, Jim's got it all right now. I mean, it, you know, we did ours in the shop. It's all up to him right now. He's doing a super job. When is the next pit stop scheduled? In about six more laps. Will that be your final one then? We're hoping so. You're hoping so. Okay, Ken. It won't be long that we'll see some more strategy unfurled here in these final pit stops. Meanwhile, the sixth place automobile, Harry Gantz, number 33, the bandit, is on pit road. He's making his pit stop right now, and he's away. They went around on rubber, and you're with Harry as the handsome one gets back on the attack. They changed all four tires then, uh, which on a green stop like that seems to be taking a bit of a risk, and of course he's just gone down a lap to the leaders, as you can see, the driving two turns one and two there. Leaders just flashing by as Harry comes back to full speed. Down at the bottom, now assumes his position as he gathers up some RPMs a little further up on the racetrack. Back straight away. Boy, if they can all get their pit stops together, I'll tell you we are going to have some kind of finish. There is Darrell Waltrip now leading. Joe Ruckman hangs in in second place. Can't say enough for the technical crew here today. We're getting some incredible pictures, all of them just doing a terrific job. Bob Brown doing the switching and just staying on top of what is a most difficult event. I've always said that it was like a golf event stretched out over a couple of miles, 40 participants, something can change the entire race at any moment, at any place. The only difference is instead of walking from hole to hole, these guys are trucking along about 194 miles an hour. Here's number 11, Darrell Waltrip. $700,000 in winnings for Darrell Waltrip. In second spot, Joe Ruttman, a relative unknown, but what a superb job he's driven. If you know anything about the Ruttmans, they're tough. A.J. Foyt has just gone to the garage area. A.J. Foyt just skimmed down pit road, made a quick left turn, and put it away. In his comeback, A.J. Foyt, car number 15, falling back into the 18th spot, now retires from the event. Oh, that makes 21 retirees. I can't remember a race, but it's quite so much attrition. This is a tremendous race of retirees. Well, there's two elements here. I can't remember as high an attrition in the day I've in several years, but neither can I remember this many cars this late in the going, still having to fight out the fray car. That, you're having a close-up look there at Darielle Waltrip's car, closer than most of us would like to be at that speed, as Joe Rutman pulls himself up into second spot. Joe Rutman, trying to give his wife Harpo the biggest Valentine she's ever had. The Daytona 500, hanging on in second place as he goes back to the trioval, nips it down in there. And then right behind uh, Rutman, we can see Bobby Allison in that car number 88, having a go at Bobby Allison. A little bit of smoke, a little puff of smoke there. Off. Is that off Darrell Waltrip's car? It is off Waltrip's car. Waltrip falling to the inside, and you're watching the leader go away. And there goes Darrell Waltrip's engine. And now it's a battle back to the line. Waltrip expires on the back straightaway. Engine detonates. Waltrip out, and they're racing back to the line for position. And this is the perfect break they needed, unless this thing stays under green. It still looks like it's under green. There's no caution thus far. Waltrip has dropped to the inside of the track, coming down to the tri-oval. Coming down on an errant back marker, running down the middle of the street there. No caution. No caution. He was on the inside, and they don't believe there's anything on that back straightaway. And up to third spot there, that white car is Kale Yarbrough. Darrell 
watch it pulling into the pit area. No doubt he'll take it straight behind pit wall. 22nd car to retire. And for the dream team, this 500 becomes a nightmare. Allison, again in front. And for the first time, you don't see somebody banging right on the rear bumper, or where there used to be a bumper. He lost the bumper in the very that. first incident of the day. There's our camera car right there, number two. And there right behind him is Kale Yarbrough. I just can't hardly believe how Kale Yarbrough stayed in that position with all that fracas of spinning a turn two and getting back to the pits. But there he is right behind this man, Joe Rutman. Right there is old Caleb. Kale Yarbrough back there in third spot. And in fact, these three seem to have pulled out a reasonable uh, gap now to the fourth car, which is Terry Labonte. Car number 44. Kale Yarbrough getting just a little tad close there. I think he <laughs> wants to get his picture. Too. There he goes to do the draft. The slingshot doesn't work. Drops back again as they come up to turn four here. Turn three. That's Jim Sauter in the pits. The Wisconsin campaigner coming back out. Well, that's lap 153. Uh, there's no way I don't think that he can do 47 more laps. So James Sauter will probably have to stop again. So it begins to sort out. So if these guys start making pit stops within the next four or five laps, they're going to have to make at least one more, but it'll be a real quickie near the end. And there's a great shot of uh, Kale Yarbrough right behind Joey Ruckman. But that's Kale in third. The car from whence those pictures coming, running second here in this near million dollar payoff. The first race of the season. They used to start at Riverside, California. Now race number one is here at Daytona, and they'll end the season at Riverside, California next November. Tremendous amount of buffeting. You can see the uh, spoiler on the back of the Stacy car there flapping about. And you can also see Kale's hood as it, uh, as it flaps quite violently in that breeze. There's Kale really swinging at that wheel as they come through turn four. And Kale having to fight that car. Looks like the handle has gone away a bit in car number 27. Tires getting a little down. Look at Kale as he came out of the trioval. He has to pick it up. That's what you don't want to do is turn right as you come off those corners. Uh, he's really uh, hanging on there hard. He's having to work pretty hard. But if anybody can work hard in this sort of racing, it's old Kale Yarbrough. He's one of the toughest guys I think I've ever met. Absolutely. He's the original no-neck monster. Now up in front is Bobby Allison. You're right in the middle of things, folks. Right in the middle of the Daytona 500. Up in front of you, Bobby Allison. Right behind you, Kale Yarbrough. You're in some of the fastest company there is in the world of motorsport. And what a great shot it was just a few laps ago. Great for us. Terrible for Darrell Waltrip when we saw the absolute initials going away of that engine as it started to puke out that right-hand exhaust pipe. If you had to make choices, who would you pick? Allison, a consistent great runner with his car going so well. There's a man checking the tote sheet today. Getting his pin out. Joe Rutman, a relative unknown. But his name is Rutman, and boy, that means he's a racer. Labonte is on pit road. Cale Yarborough, who's twice won this event. Terry Labonte is like fourth spot at the moment. Pulls onto pit road and uh, changes outside tires. Obviously gasses up, but I'm sure at 156 left, at least 44, he's almost sure to have to stop again at least once, just a real quickie. That average speed in the last lap when you went all the way around the racetrack in these cars was 191 and a half mile an hour average. That's some kind of Valentine's Day trip over to grandmother's house. Here I go. Sauter, car number five, one of the other Stacy cars. There goes Bobby Allison around. Jim Sauter, who's been hanging on so well, but he has just made a pit stop. So when they make their stops, they should. Uh, he should unlap himself. Joe Rutman dropping to the bottom of the banking. Perhaps Is he he's coming, coming in? in. Indeed, it looks like Rutman may be coming in. No, he is staying out. No, he's, 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 no, he's, he's making in. a late be. stop. I mean, he came all the way down. Yeah, he road. couldn't make his mind up by what hard right. Joe Rutman is coming into the pits. You're with him for what could be his final pit stop. Here's Larry Newber. Joe Rutman comes to a stop. This is one of their scheduled pit stops. Here's the guy who has dominated USAC stock car racing for the past three seasons. He's won about a third of all the races he's entered on the USAC stock car schedule. They change the two outside tires. They fill that fuel cell up once again, and Joe Rutman is off and still among the leaders. 
You see that tremendous jerk as the car drops down off the jack. He's very careful not to slip the clutch too much. And if you're going to spin anything, you want to spin the wheels, warm up the back tyres, change the outside right and the right tyres. And he's back on the same lap as the leaders. Bobby Allison first, Cale Yarborough after that long slide has gathered back up and brought the MC Anderson car back out another time. I'm wondering if I can ask Ned Jarrett a question here. We're 159 laps into this race, Ned Jarrett, and that means there are 102 and a half miles left. Ned, it seems to me they have to stop one more time. Kenny will cut them awfully close. Most of the time they can't go over 100 miles, particularly at the speed that they're running out there now. But we've seen in the past that sometimes they stretch a few extra miles an hour out of them. And I'm sure on these last pit stops that they put every ounce of gasoline in them they could possibly get. Let's report on A.J. Foyt here. He, of course, pulled his car into the garage. He had an engine problem with it. A.J. is pretty disgusted. He didn't want to talk to anyone. And now let's go to Larry Newber on pit road. Well, Bobby Allison is scoring right at you. Here he comes for what he hopes to be at least his second to last stop. And if all things go super well and they pull a rabbit out of the hat, maybe he can milk out this load of fuel to the end of the race. But that's unlikely. They'll try and slosh as much as they possibly can into this car. If we have lengthy caution flags for the last quarter of the race, you never know. This stop might work. 13.6 seconds on Allison, outside rubber and new fuel. One of the cars that we're overlooking today and very, very strong is the Ford from Dawsonville, Georgia of Bill Elliott. He has two brothers and they come in here and they flip a coin to see who's going to be cruising. They don't seem to take it too seriously, but they race very well. And right now, that car is running up in the top positions, running back in six at the present time, Bill Elliott. Who's also put a lap on uh, Jim Sauter, but of course, Hale is going to have to come into the pits probably this lap. Um, I don't see how they can do 40 laps. We have Dale Earnhardt running out in the very early stage of this race on about lap 32. Well, they've still got 40 laps to go. If they can do 40 laps, uh, someone better get the measuring jar out, I think. That's right. 100 miles remain at this moment in the Daytona 500, the 24th edition, which has been as good as it's ever been. Here is Bobby Allison fighting his way up from second spot is Cale Yarborough in number 27. Getting ready to pin. Cale is coming on the pit road. Now he could be within the veil. He you might make it all the way to the checkered flag. When you're running at 193, 194 miles an hour, which is still a lap they're turning in this race, you do use rather a lot of fuel. Watching the pit time on Cale Yarborough, tell you those last two or three laps are going to be frantic and frenzied. And oh, oh my kingdom for maybe a pint, even a half a pint of fuel. 15.3 seconds, and he changed the inside uh, tires, which is, I would have thought, rather unusual. The leader, Bobby Allison, at 160 laps, 400 miles, the average speed, 147.164, far off the road. Sweet by Kale Yarbrough as he pulls out of the pits, just a little bit too far in front for Kale to pick him up as a draft. Here's Nick. Daryl Waltrip has already had time to take a shower and get back out into the crowd here, Ken. Daryl, that thing just sort of went without warning. Yeah, it did. <laughs> but we wanted to improve over last year, so I think we finished a little higher up than we did last year anyway. Well, you had to because you ran longer in the race, and you're right. also in the lead when it happened. Boy, that has to be a disappointment. Well, I'm real disappointed, Ned. I really had it going, and uh, I really think I had the only car out there right now that could beat Bobby. He doesn't have any trouble. He's home free. His car's really handling and running good. And we adjusted ours, and it really helped, and we were right there with him. But uh, Bobby's been running most of the race without a rear bumper. Would that help him or hurt him? Well, let's say it'll help him today because it looks like something is. <laughs> it sure does. Okay, Ken, that's the story from the garage area. Now 163 laps complete, just 37 to go. The leader is Bobby Allison, the second-place man, Joe Rutman. The Alabama gang has their best right up on the point. No question about Bobby Allison. 65 career wins. Ron Bouchard is pitting right now. Car number 47 is on pit road. He's running back in 10th spot, a lap down. But it's Allison. Allison the story at the moment. Joe Rutman in second. Cale Yarborough third. Labonte is fourth. Jim Sauter maintaining fifth position. 
all over America, Ramada is changing the ho-hums into the ahas. We're taking ho-hums out, we're putting ahas in. We're making changes for the better, because we like the grins. Oh, oh. Ah, ah, ah. We're putting ahas into our bedrooms, our lobbies, and our restaurants. So if you've been tired of the ho-hums, come to Ramada. We're waiting for you with some very big ahas. We're changing right before your eyes. Aha. Gives you a V-twin engine, monoshock suspension, shaft drive, and the satisfaction of knowing that while the others are off following the crowd, you're not. On the racetracks of the world, STP. On the roads of the world, STP. Wherever performance counts, STP is there. STP oil treatment is number one. Get racing-born performance with STP oil filters. 26 laps to go on the Daytona 500. Let's get this report from Ned Jarrett. Jim Sauter came down pit road a lap ago, Jim, and just a fly. And Jim Stacy, you said that you were trying to get him to stay out there another lap so that you could go the rest of the distance here. But then he came back in this time, went right on by the pits. He's got a problem. Yeah, I'd say he's lost the brakes. Well, he was not able to get stopped in his pits. He needs to stop very badly, Jim. He's uh, low on gas or maybe even out of gas, but he couldn't get it stopped when he came into the pits. What a tough break for a fellow who has been running right up there with the leaders all day. So we have six cars continuing in the lead lap. Out back on the lead lap is Harry. Harry Gant, the bandit, he runs in fifth in that lead lap. Then comes Lamonti in fourth. Third is that number 27 of Kaylee Arborough. In second, the yellow and blue car of Joel Rutman. And up in front, as we watch, Sauter coming back, circling around very slowly on the apron. And once again, you're looking out at Bill Elliott's car from the number, I think that's the 33 car we're getting these pictures from. Bill Elliott is running seventh overall on the field. And he's gone a lap down. Now, there's one getting an interesting view of this battle going on. Bill Elliott holding right in there, just about a foot off the rear bumper. There's the leader, Allison. His interval now a little better than three seconds. And there is second place, hotly contested. Kaylee Yarborough has it for the moment. Terry Labonte has gone to third. Rutman now dropping to fourth. These three guys need to concentrate on getting a good draft going because uh, Bobby Allison's pulling inexorably away. He's 10 seconds in front now. 175 laps are complete. It's dwindled down to 25 laps remaining, and there's the interval between the first place car and this four car battle for second spot. He's really expanded on that lead. 10 and 9 10 seconds. Can Bobby Allison stay there? He's been racing here since 1961 at the Daytona Speedway. He won this race in 1978 for Bud Moore. Car number 98 has just run its last lap. Morgan Shepard showing some smoke, and he was coasting in the one and two and slowing down on the inside of the track. Here's Ned Jarrett. Well, Jim Sauter is trying to get back into the pits now, Ken. The crew has gone out to try to slow that car down. They'll get him stopped. Boy, this has really cost him a lot of time. But can you imagine? They're going to change tires on the car, and they're going to fill it up with gasoline, and I guess they'll send me back out there. But can you imagine going out there and running at 190 miles an hour without brakes? Robert Harrington now is looking under the hood to see if he can see what the problem is with the brakes. Well, it is legal that he can go under the hood uh, on pit road and look and see what the problem is. He thinks that maybe a, a brake line is broken, and I think he has found it here on that left side. But making a repair quick enough to get him back out to be in any kind of contention, well, I don't know if they can do that or not, because they continue to change the tires, and now he's going up to the master cylinder, and what he'd like to do is cut the brakes completely off of that left left front wheel where apparently it's shooting out the fluid from the master cylinder. So I'm afraid that he's going to be in the pits here for a while, but they're going to get him back as quickly as they can. They have some brake fluid there now that they're about to pour in it. They've closed that line off. It's amazing at how quickly they can do a lot of things. If you go into a garage, it might take uh, at least a half a day to do this. But now they have that thing almost repaired. And you know, Ken, he's not going to know whether he's got brakes or not until he needs to slow down and it might be too late then. <laughs> 
That's one way of looking at it, I suppose. And here's Bobby Allison. Bobby Allison's car running incredibly strongly. Jim Sauter falters after a great start here today. CBS Sports live coverage of the Daytona 500 will continue after this word from your local station. Monday, two great comedies. Can Merlin's Magic conjure up a dream date for Zach? Then Captain Lewis comes unbuttoned over missing diamonds on Private Benjamin. Monday. This is CBS. Floyd here claims to have had a close encounter. Claim? I saw Well, so we wanted to get his reaction to Intellivision Space Battle. That's it! That's it! It happened just like that! There's a ship that took me in! Two and those explosions! I'll never forget it, Mr. Plinkin! Me and Blue Floyd. In Television Space Battle, you may never come closer to a close encounter. Ain't you listening? It's Blue Line. Dodge has a good thing going. Get a car, get a check from participating metropolitan area Dodge dealers of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Make your best deal. Then get $300 to $1,000 cash back on most new 81 and 82 cars and trucks at participating dealers. You can take your rebate in cash direct from Dodge or apply it toward your down payment. Act now and get top trade-in values plus rebates up to $1,000. Now Dodge announces rebates increased up to $2,000. See a participating dealer for... Channel 2 Newsbreakers, weekdays at 5. Bobby Allison still in front. 19 cars are now on the track. 23 have retired. Back in 1966, 17 cars finished out of a field of 50. That was in 66, and in 76, he had 44 cars running out. Start in 17, finish. There's your second place car, Kyle Diabra. Bobby Allison in first. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. Ken, we're still in Jim Salter's pits. We talked to Robert Harrington, the crew chief on it, and he says that he will have rear brakes. They shut off the front brakes completely, that the pad had come off of one of the left front there, and that's what caused them to lose brakes altogether. But they have a system on it so where they can shut off either the front or the rear. So they have shut off the front brakes. So he does have rear. That'll slow him down at least. Won't stop him quite as quick, though. Report now is that 18 cars are still on the track. We have completed 181 laps here in the Daytona 500. There are just 19 remaining. If there's one tire that dominates America's racetracks, it's Goodyear's Racing Eagles. And now we've tamed our Eagles for the streets as an advanced line of high-performance radios. Eagle NCT, our ultimate performance radio. Eagle GT, already chosen as the optional radial on the 1982 Corvette. Eagle ST, with performance that belies its price. The Eagles, tamed for the streets, but far from tame. Okay, cross X right on two. In a ball game, I don't care how much I sweat. The more I sweat, the meaner I feel. <clears throat> but off the field, I want to feel nice and dry. And I want to smell nice. That's why I use Speed Stick Super Dry Antiperspirant. It's the wide stick, effective protection with more dryness to help fight wetness. And it goes on dry so you can get dressed right away. So get on the stick. So dry, you can get dressed right away. Speed Stick Super Dry Antiperspirant. By Menon. Here comes Harry Gant and the Skull Bandit in for a pit stop. Hi, I'm Harry Gant. When I bring the Skull Bandit in for a pit stop, I come in for a paint stop. Because while the rest of the team takes care of the bandit, I get to take a little pinch of Skull, put it between my cheek and gum for real tobacco pleasure without lighting up. Now that's what we call teamwork. And Skull's what we call team pleasure. For real tobacco pleasure without lighting up, try Skull. A pinch is all it takes. Bang Up Washington's birthday sale explodes with values. Now through Monday only. By George, there's paid at half price. Pay only $4.99 or $5.49 a gallon. Or salute the $51 savings on a 40-piece Craftsman Mechanics tool set. Now $29.99. Sale fireworks continue with Sears Best Spectrum Oil. Priced at just 79 cents a quart. Now through Monday only. For Bang Up buys all over the store, you can count on Sears. 
Next weekend on CBS Sports, be a part of the action. The all-out drive of NCAA basketball as Notre Dame takes the court against South Carolina. The quiet tension that overpowers the Pacific in the Los Angeles Open. And the lightning pace of NBA action as the Phoenix Suns meet the Philadelphia 76ers. The action continues next weekend here on CBS Sports. Following today's Daytona 500 coverage, stay with CBS Sports. Great basketball. Two of the NBA Giants tip off as the Celtics go up against the L.A. Lakers. It's all here with Dick Stockton and Bill Russell right after the Daytona 500 this afternoon on CBS Sports. Bobby Allison is in first. Five cars are running the lead lap here as we're down to 185 laps complete. Remaining just 15. And there in second place lies Joe Rutman with number 26. Cale Yarborough in third position. The fourth spot is Terry Levante, and in fifth is the bandit, Harry Gant. In sixth, a lap down is Bill Elliott. In seventh is Ron Bouchard. In eighth is a scraped up number one of Buddy Baker. In the ninth position is Jody Ridley. And running in tenth right now is Roy Smith, that driver who came down here from Vancouver, British Columbia, with a car that the town put together so that he could race in this event. There we have another great shot of Cale Yarbrough closely following Joe Rutman, but even though these guys are up in a multi-car draft, which should be giving them an advantage, Bobby Allison is pulling away at a horrifying rate. He's now got nearly an 18-second lead on that second bunch, and I've, how he can run that strongly on his own, he's obviously been sandbagging all the week. Anyway, Ned Jarrett's down there with Dale Inman. Ken, one, one year ago today, this man, Dale Inman, was in the crew chief on Richard Petty's car. The car was running in second place in the late stages of the race. Here he is today, the crew chief on Joe Rutman's car, which is running second. Dale, you're in a similar position. The circumstances appear to be a little different. 48 seconds flat, Joe, 48 seconds flat. He's telling his driver yeah, how fast got, he ran. They got me this time because we got to stop for gas, and, and Bobby's got enough lead that he can stop and go, and I don't know what the other two cars out there do. Uh, Labonte and Labonte stopped before we did. I'm sure he'll have to stop, and I'm not sure about Kale. But uh, our car just not running good enough to catch Bobby. We, we need a caution, but we don't need to cause it. So uh, we'll just have to stop a little gas in and go and get all we can get. When you said they got you, that means that you've got to stop and you don't know about them. I don't know about Bobby and I don't know about Kale. I know Terry will, but, you know, you still got to get in and out of the pit. You'll just take on gas? Gas only. Okay, they'll make a very quick pit stop like they did with Richard Petty here a year ago. But the difference is they have to do that this time, and he doesn't know if the others will have to or not. Well, Bobby Allison, I know, has got at least, would have to run at least 40 laps. And I see that uh, Dale Yarbrough had only got 38 laps to go. He was the last man to stop. So in theory, he might just be able to make it. But I reckon even 38 laps is really pushing it. If Bobby Allison goes through to the end of this race without stopping, it'll be a miracle. Certainly, we owe a great debt of thanks to Dale Inman, and Joe Rutten, Jim Stacy, and their entire crew for the time they've allowed us in getting that camera set up and giving you those great pictures you've seen. And the same can be said for Hal Needham and Bert, Travis Carter, the crew chief, Harry Gant, the driver on car 33. Their cooperation has been terrific, and certainly to Jeff Healy and this crew that has brought these cameras from Australia. They've certainly given us some of the most exciting moments we've ever witnessed on television in the world of motor racing. Will Allison win it? We'll know shortly. If your car was built when gas was 60 cents, you could be in serious trouble. Hey, hey, wasn't you in here yesterday? But right now, American Motors wants to save you money on the new car you need. Until March 31st, American Motors will give you up to $800 over dealer trade-in for your car. And the older it is, the more it's worth. We'll even help if you don't have a trade, because American Motors wants you to have a new car. This bud's for the guys who got what it takes to shake, rattle, and keep on rolling. This bud's for you, for all you do. Yeah, just for you, that distinctively clean, crisp taste that says Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. Vitalis says it's true. A man has to keep himself under control. I just told him something shocking, but he's under control. First grade Philip, the 
your lifeboats aren't full. But I'm under control. The Vitalis pump gives your hair the control you want. It's America's leading men's pump. Vitalis sells more than all others combined to give men a terrific natural look. I'm under control. Use Vitalis, America's best-selling men's pump, and you'll say, I'm under control. Of the dozens of airlines in this country, one airline, for the third year in a row, has carried more passengers than any other in the entire free world. That airline is Eastern. If you help make us America's favorite airline, we thank you. If you haven't flown Eastern recently, give us a try. We'll show you that we really do earn our wings every day. On our way back for the conclusion of the Daytona 500, let me remind you that coming up next, NBA. It's the Los Angeles Lakers and the world champion Boston Celtics. A late word out of the forum in Inglewood. Magic Johnson will play for the Lakers today. At halftime, we'll update the Jerry Cooney story. Cooney has returned to his home in Long Island. Injured left shoulder. That championship fight against Larry Holmes in March, now very much in jeopardy. That story is coming up at halftime. Will Bobby Allison's fuel hold up? Let's go back now to Ken Squire and find out. Kenny? Well, Brent, the moment is here. 120,000 racing enthusiasts at the birthplace of speed sense that it's coming down to an issue on pit road, a matter of seconds getting in and out for Bobby Allison that could make the difference in his second win or give Joe Rutman the dark horse, the relative unknown, an incredible Daytona 500 victory, or perhaps Cale Yarborough, who's running right there with him, or Terry Labonte. David Hobbs, I'm Ken Squire. Down in the pits today, we have Ned Jarrett, Larry Newber, Brock Yates is with us. Delighted to bring you this great racing epic. And in the final moments, that pit stop is taking place on car number two, Rutman. Let's go to Larry Newber. Well, a year ago, a pit stop just about at this time was what won the race for Dale Inman and then his driver, Richard Petty. But the stop today, it was just a very, very brief gulp of fuel is probably going to be what will keep his driver out of victory lane. Ken? They still have to be delighted with Rutman's performance here today. The name Rutman almost spells race as far as many Americans are concerned. His father built the cars, the sprinters with which Troy Rutman toured in the old 3A days and broke all the track records at the fairgrounds across America. Then Troy became the youngest man ever to win at Indianapolis. And now his brother has just made his pit stop and he stays right in the lead hunt. Meanwhile, Allison has to pitch shortly. Let's go to Ned Jarrett. And we're in Cale Yarborough's pits with Tim Brewer, the crew chief on the car. Are you going to have to make pit stops? Well, Ned, we changed the tires on the car last trip, and uh, evidently got stagger messed up. The car got a little bit loose on him, but uh, I believe we can go the rest of the way. I don't know if he can handle uh, the Terry Labonte car, but we're going we're gonna to ride it out and see how we do. But you do have enough fuel? Yes, we've got enough fuel. Uh, we stopped several laps after Bobby, and Bobby's got to run 100 miles to finish, and uh, the question is, can he make it right now? What do you think? I'm betting on him not finishing, but I know he's going to try. I know I would. Well, Buddy Baker is coming in just for a dash of gas, and we're talking to Tim Brewer here, so we'll see what his prognostication is, whether he can make it or not. Okay. 18 and a half second lead for Bobby Allison over Terry Labonte. Now in second, Kaylee Opero third. Ruckman drops to fourth in the overall standings with fifth, Harry Gant. The question is, will Allison have to pit? Will he have to come in? There he is with Ron Bouchard. Bouchard is running a lap down in seventh place. In sixth place is Elliott. Gant is also being shown as a lap down. Field coming by. Let's get this audio report from Larry Newber. Well, Ken, most of the other crews say that there's no way they can go 100 miles on one load of fuel. But the Allison crew from crew chief to Bobby's wife, who has been keeping the charge, insists they can go the distance, maybe even with a couple of extra laps. They will not pit. They are going the distance on what they were able to sneak into that gas tank the last time he stopped. Allison is still there. Can he stay there? What do you think, David? Well, obviously, one has to go with the uh, prior knowledge of these other crew chiefs. Gosh, Ron Bouchard really got all crossed up there. And um, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, well, I would have thought that he'd be very pushed in because everybody was coming on about lap 32 the first time round, and nobody's gone more than about 35, 36 laps yet. And if he can suddenly do over 40 laps, well, that's pretty good. How he's doing it, we don't know. Allison came here for the first time in 1961, then missed for four years, came back in 65, and has been here every year since. 
Labonte coming into the pits, and it looks like he's run out of fuel. Indeed, Labonte is coasting down to the turn number four. Number nine, Bill Elliott. Sixth place car overlapped for a second time by the leader, Bobby Allison. Will this be his 66th win? Or will he come up winning this race by a gulf? 97 laps are complete. Three laps remain in the Daytona 500, and there is Terry Labonte, car being pushed frantically. It fires. Two to go. Got it going. It had, it had run right out of fuel. It took them all that time to get the pump, to get the fuel pumped up to the tank back to the engine before it had fired. Larry Newber. Terry Gant is on pit road. Gant Pitty, number 33, fifth place car is on pit road. Meanwhile, we're down to it. Will 88 create its own energy crisis here, or will it go home and win? The 500. 24th running, looking for his second win. Comes into the tri -oval. White flag is out. This is it. Final lap. In second place now is car number 27, Cale Yarborough. Quick word from Larry Nover. Larry, you said you might be a little concerned about this last lap. Bobby has not been drafting. Right. It consumes a lot more fuel not to run in the draft. We just got him hooked up with the 47 car. To go, but I think we got it now. Well, less than a half ago, Ken. How's he doing? Looking good. He's pulling up on car number two, trying to put the Rutland car a lap down in the final moments. Here he comes. A sprint to the finish. Allison coming down, and he's right behind Rutland as they come to the line. Down the checkered flag about to come out, and sprinting to it is number 88. Bobby Allison has won. Daytona 500 for the second time in his career. Fender flapping a little as he came across second place. Number 27, Cale Yarborough, twice a winner of the 500. And the terror of Timmonsville fighting that steering wheel right to the finish line. Cale Yarborough for second spot. Gary Ballou right behind him out of the top 10 as they come to the line. The third position. We'll go to car number two, our in-car camera machine, Joe Rutman, being shown as third. What a race he's driven. There we see him coming off turn four. Coming down to take the checkered flag. You're with Joe Rutman. Now you're back with number 88, Bobby Allison, as he circulates around the track and takes a deep breath. Well, he pulled it off. Bobby Allison has won his second 500, becomes only the second man in history to do so. Cale's won it twice. Now Bobby's won it twice. There's Cale Yarborough, who has finished second today. The 67th career win for Bobby Allison comes in the biggest one of them all, the classic, the Daytona 500. The other teams applaud him as he rolls down pit road shortly moves to victory lane where Ned Jarrett will be standing by and here is Joe Rutman on his cool off lap. Thank you Joe. And he just lets her coast up through the banking a little here. Here is Bobby Allison and his wife Judy. His son Davey was here racing earlier this week. His brother making a comeback after his terrible, horrific crash at Charlotte, North Carolina last year in the World 600, which you saw on Memorial Day here on CBS. And now Bobby Allison is about to grace victory lane. Number 88, the Die Guard Racing Team, swapping drivers this year. And an ecstatic combination of crew members, some of his enthusiasts and scorers, pushing this, what has been rocket ship, now 3,700 pound chunk up into the victory area and there is Joe Rutman headed back where all the other folks go the garage area when these things are over the winner Bobby Allison pulls into victory lane I know you feel all right. I'll How does he that. get something to drink before they've even got him out of the car? I don't well, understand that. Oh, they him in pit lane. You're on your way, Bill. But uh, well, he had a very much blessed race with Bobby Allison today. A 
a word from Ned Jarrett. Well, Bobby Allison, as you can see, has a big smile on his face here as he unbuckles his safety helmet and the other safety paraphernalia, of course, that is mandatory in NASCAR racing. He's had a good couple of weeks here at Daytona. Of course, he won the Clash a week ago today and uh, looked like was going to win the 125-mile qualifier on Thursday and got passed right at the line by K.O. Yarborough and uh, Terry Labonte, I believe, uh, was right in that thick of that, too. But anyway, he wound up in third place and figured that he was such a contender in everything that went on here. He's in a brand new ride. The first time that he's driven this Jim Gardner die guard on number 88. Now he comes out of the car and waves to the crowd. Great reception. He was the most popular driver in 1981, an award that is voted on by his peers. Bobby, congratulations. Thank you, Ned. Uh, I have to say the old Gatorade die guard bunch really did it for me today. Uh, the car ran good, it handled good, they had great pit stops. Just, I'm just tickled. Well, I can see that and see why. Now, you lost that bumper early in the race. What effect did it have on the car? Well, it made the car looser, and I was real worried for a while, but uh, Gary adjusted on the car some for me, and uh, or had the boys adjust on it, and uh, they got it better and better as the day went on. So uh, uh, finally, uh, it went pretty good except in the trial. It really was wormy in the trial, and I, uh, before we lost the bumper, it was not quite a contrast from a year ago today. Yeah, it really is. You know, there's all sad faces last year, all glad ones this year. Bobby, were you out of gas there at the end or close to out? Uh, you hadn't quit on pit road, Ned. That's why they had to push it in. Well, boy, I'll tell you, you'll have an extra pair to say tonight. Well, his wife Judy is here with him and a lot of jubilation in Victor Lane, Bobby. Right, Ned, and uh, I want to say I love Ronald Reagan. All right, now back to Ken. At an average speed of 153.991 miles per hour, Bobby Allison has recorded his his second victory in the great American race, the Daytona 500. And for a closing thought about what we've seen here today, let's go to Brock Yates. Thank you, Ken. Actually, two thoughts. One, they say in this sport that there's no place except first place. There is no second place. But today, there was clearly a second place. Cale Yarborough's effort was incredible. A 190 mile an hour spin off turn two, recovered. We have to know that that chassis was messed up and that uh, ride across the grass, and yet he manhandled that automobile all afternoon. He's a terribly plucky man, but a very skillful man. And in this case, not to take anything away from Allison, surely the master driver of the day has to be Cale Yarbrough's. The other thought is that we had some bad crashes here, and yet these automobiles, great old iron horses that they are, brought everybody through safely. A lot of people say that they're kind of crude. They don't have all those wonderful aer aerodynamic devices and titanium and, and space age uh, fabrication techniques that formula cars have, but I'll take them every time because they demand the best of a driver, and when they, the driver loses them, they walk away from them, and I think they deserve an awful lot of credit. You are so right, Brock Yates. Just amazing the amount of abuse those cars took today and came through and gave us such a great race right to the final moments, David. Well, you can't help but say it was Bobby Allison's day. His car caused the first major wreck of the day. He was about 200 feet in front of the second major wreck of the day. He seemed to have more power than anybody else. He seemed to go further on the gas tank, so uh, you couldn't really want a better day, actually. It was by 22 and 8 ten seconds, which Bobby Allison defeated Kelly Yarborough in second spot. Joe Rutman coming across in third today. And they've just told us Terry Labonte is recording fourth with Bill Elliott fifth, Ron Bouchard sixth, Harry Gant coming across in seventh, and then it was uh, Buddy Baker in eighth place. I want to thank so many, so many people, particularly the folks in the truck for the great pictures, and the people here at the Daytona Speedway, Jim Hunter, Jim Foster, and all the rest who made it happen. For Larry Newber. And Ned Jarrett, Brock Gates, David Hobbs, I'm Ken Squire. Thank you for being with us to enjoy the 24th running of the great American race, the Daytona 500.